happening. So with that, I will kick it off to our ho our MC, Vero. Hello, welcome. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Yep. OK, uh, so welcome, and thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, I'm Alexander Romero. I go by Roro. Um, I work at the Defense Digital Service, uh, but was also previously a Marine uh, from 2001 to 2006. Um, and I was asked to or invited to MC this, and I was like, sure, why not, especially on the Marine Corps' birthday. So, hoorah. <laughs> um, so this is the first ever Veterans in Security event hosted by HackerOne. Um, the main goal is to bring a community together to celebrate uh, in honor of Veterans Day. Um, and also because there is such a shortage in terms of cybersecurity need um, you know, throughout both the United States and abroad. Um, yep, yep. <laughs> uh, I'm watching chats here on the side. So if you wanna uh, say anything, feel free. Um, so the second most um, important key challenges the global security community needs to address is, uh, is that of skills and capabilities. And so I think um, that's probably what we wanted to really discuss today was a little bit around how we can invite more veterans to participate in such an interesting uh, community. Um, so just a few stats here that I just wanted to share. Apparently, and I, I keep hearing that there are millions of jobs that are needed to be filled by cybersecurity experts, but um, According to Cybersecurity Magazine, uh, the Cybersecurity Talent Crunch uh, to create 3.5 million unfilled jobs and to fill those jobs globally by 2021. So there is a huge need. And um, there is an expected 350% growth in open cybersecurity positions from 2013 to 2021. That's, that's been happening. Um, so a little bit about myself. I used to work as an electro-optical ordnance uh, repair back in the Marine Corps. And I think we can go to the next slide here. Um, yep, happy birthday, Marine Corps. I'm not controlling the slide. So if we have some hiccups here, because this is the first one, hopefully you'll be forgiving. Uh, and then go to the next slide. <laughs> OK. Um, and so just, I guess, a little bit about myself as well. Uh, we, we are going to have a bunch of really awesome speakers today. Uh, actually, first, of all, let's go over this slide. Uh, so the Fence Digital Service. Um, the Undercroft um, has helped as well. The uh, see, VetSec and the Cyber Ohana project as well as Softworks have all sort of partnered uh, to make this happen. Um, okay, so sorry, next slide. Yeah, and just echoing uh, Roro, um, huge thank you to all of our partners. Um, this event could not have been done without um, all of the wonderful speakers we'll be hearing from. Um, uh, we just wanted to also announce, um, we are gonna be, we created a um, specific CTF just for everyone who participated in this event. Um, the website is there, it will launch on November 13th, um, but you do need a code in order to participate. Um, we'll have some uh, swag and cash prizes from Hacker HackerOne. Um, so we hope that you take your skills that you learned from Matt Kiley today, um, and you're able to put them to use on the CTF this weekend. Um, so with that, I'll give it back to Roro and he can uh, go through the rest of the day. Okay, so sorry about that hiccup there. Um, I am not the best MC. They shouldn't have chosen me for this, but here I am. <laughs> uh, so here's a bit of the agenda, I guess, for today. Is, um, we're going to have an intro to uh, lines of departure and transitioning out and into cybersecurity by Wilson Batista. Um, the VETSEC introduction by Tom Marsland, the O course, NOAS top 10 obstacle course for beginners by Matt Keeley, uh, Jen just mentioned, and um, a journey through InfoSec and starting uh, the Undercroft by Adam Sheffield, uh, Sheffield uh, and closing remarks at the very end. Um, so without further ado, I guess I'll finish introducing myself uh, again, Alexander Romero. Um, and because I am currently a government employee, I have to make sure we put in this uh, caveat here that uh, my opinions don't necessarily reflect that of my employer. Um, but I, uh, as I was beginning to say earlier, was in the Marines. I uh, served from 2001 to 2006 as an electro optical ordnance repair. I got a chance to work on all sorts of uh, really fun toys, lasers, missile systems, guidance systems, that kind of stuff. And um, then one day the Marine Corps was like, um, you also know how to type pretty good. And so <laughs> they made me a Unix administrator, as you do. Um, and that sort of kicked off my career in cybersecurity and, and InfoSec. Um, 
you know, managing systems that you know are the target of adversaries um, uh, gives you a different sort of perspective on what cybersecurity means, makes it a little bit more real. So for me, um, throughout my career, I've been trying to figure out how to continue giving back. And there was this, um, I don't know, you have a certain sense of mission and purpose when you're in the military that is really hard to create or to get back once you've left. And so I always thought after I got out of the Marines, it would be very hard for me to, to sort of fill that gap. Um, but over time, I sort of found that this, this community and this, um, this field was a way to do that because I could actually try to protect um, both the American people and some of the things that we're interested in. Um, later on in my career, eventually got more directly into security engineering and um, I was put in charge of various top level DOD sites like Marines.mil, Air Force.mil, Navy.mil, um, and Defense.gov, just to mention a few. Um, and wanted to make sure that these sites, especially the Marine Corps site, didn't get hacked or defaced. So I tried basically every tool that I could find uh, in order to better understand what our adversaries were gonna maybe do against us. This was around 2009, 2010 timeframe. Um, over that period of time, I got to learn really that this is an awesome community to, to be working in. And I found that sort of sense of purpose, uh, again, by working with folks in this community um, and also having an important mission that tied that all together. Um, so that's partially why I'm really excited to be hosting uh, this today, uh, this series of uh, discussions. Uh, some of them are gonna be pre-recorded. Um, and so for the first one though, uh, we're gonna kick it off with, let's see, Wilson uh, Bautista. And Wilson is a retired uh, military officer uh, who is currently the founder and CEO of the consulting firm June Cyber and the executive director of the Cyber HANA project and a, fisc a fiscally uh, sponsored project under the Social Good Fund, uh, which is a California nonprofit corporation and a registered 501c3. Um, he provides expertise in the domains of InfoSec leadership, policy, architecture, compliance, and risk to his clients. He also has a master's degree in information systems from uh, Boston University and a master's of business administration from the University of Florida. Uh, so with that, we're gonna kick it off with a video because uh, he requested that we do a pre-recorded session. Um, but we'll also put the link here in the side just in case the audio is like funky or the video doesn't come through well, y'all can just time it up so we can watch this together. Um, so I'll put this in chat and Jenna, if you wanna kick it off. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Wilson Bautista Jr. and welcome to the line of departure transitioning out and into cybersecurity. Before I begin, I want to thank HackerOne for, for having me um, come and, and talk for their first ever Veterans Focus uh, Cybersecurity Conference. And uh, yeah, it's a real it's a real treat to be able to do this. And I've got an awesome team at a Cyber Ohana project that works with uh, veterans and their spouses to explore careers in cybersecurity. Just a little bit about myself: I am a Marine Corps veteran. Um, I started out in the Marines as an enlisted man and I was uh, in the music program, I was in the band, and I played piano, and I finished my, my degree in music while I was in, so I decided that I was going to, uh, I, was, I decided I was gonna get my commission, so I wanted to go to officer candidate school, so 
I went to Quantico, got hazed again, um, running up those those hills, and I eventually commissioned as a second lieutenant, and they um, they sent me off to the basic school, and then they sent me off over to um, the communications officer's school. Uh, so for the army types, it would be signal officer's course. So I, I did that, and um, I got to deploy to Afghanistan, I, I did all of that and I learned how to connect things and to see how, you know, just how, how the networks connect to each other and how we communicate in the battle space. But uh, because I was a junior officer and there was a downturn in the, in the armed forces at the time, uh, uh, I wasn't able to stay in on active duty. So I had actually uh, six months before my end of active service or ETS uh, for, again, the, the army types, so you understand. And so I had a lot of things to think about and I had a real rough transition. Um, but one thing I didn't want to do is find a career in, in cybersecurity. I thought it was really cool um, to connect things, but I thought it was actually way sexier to learn how to break things. So I, I started out as a defense contractor um, and auditing, and I learned a lot about security technical implementations um, and then secure configurations, looking at different operating systems, Windows, Linux, um, and doing all of the configuration checks for networking devices. I was able to do some um, physical penetration testing and then I moved over to a multinational corporation, um, and I was uh, I was responsible for I was responsible for um, creating secure configurations for the technologies that they had. And then um, eventually, I got promoted to uh, run an, a, their vulnerability management services portfolio, which included um, vulnerability management, security configuration management, end of life monitoring and web application scanning. So uh, that was a lot of fun. And um, and then I and then I came down to St. Petersburg, Florida, where I was a director of IT and information security. I got to build those programs from the ground up. And now I'm a cybersecurity consultant uh, with my own business. And I run a project, um, the Cyber Ohana Project, which is uh, fiscally sponsored by Social Good Fund. And uh, yeah, so one of the things that I love to talk about is how do we get a career in cybersecurity? You, you've already heard that I didn't really have a uh, like a, a big background, especially coming from being a musician. But I was able to I was able to take the next steps forward and uh, really find what I wanted to do. Um, but it took a long time, and I, I think there's an easier way. And so this this talk really is about, you know, if whether or not you're getting out of the service or you're already out of the service and you're thinking about a career in cybersecurity, uh, we have a multitude of resources uh, as veterans that we can that we can look at. And it could be a little bit confusing. So what I kind of want to do today is really just talk about like maybe a bare bone skeleton of, of a process that I think that could work for most people. And we'll, uh, we'll do that and um, we'll try to, try to help you out as much as we can. Okay, so as far as the agenda is concerned, um, we're gonna be talking about six things. First, uh, we're gonna be talking about preparing yourself. How are you? How are you getting ready to enter civilian life? The next part we're going to talk about is exploring cybersecurity. What about this field excites you? That's what we kind of want to narrow down and and figure out. So you're maximizing your time for studying, and you're actually not just shotgunning resumes out there and hoping for the best you're you're targeting and you're hitting you're hitting the target maybe you're not hitting black but you're you're hitting the target of what you want to do the next thing we're going to talk about is gap analysis and what this is is what do you need to get into those roles right um, we'll talk a little bit more about that 
Um, and then the next part is training. What training do you need to fill those gaps? Uh, this could be, you know, college education, certifications, on-the-job experience, internships, stuff like that. We'll get more um, more involved with that, and then we'll look at veteran career support programs. Uh, again, I said it before. We have so many different programs out there. It's it's really uh, it's really great. We have amazing partners that want to help veterans get their foot in the door. Uh, but we, we want to make sure that we're focusing our effort into the right programs because one program may be, let's say, more, more, um, more important for somebody who wants to go into network security, vice web application security. So you want to be able to take training, um, the, the things that are available from, from different companies to support veteran initiatives. And then lastly, we're going to talk about execute. What do you need to do to get the job? So six things that we're going to talk about. I will try not to bore you, but I'm very excited. And I hope that you'll learn something from this. Okay, so prepare yourself. How are you getting ready to enter civilian life? Okay, I have four points here. Number one is uh, come to terms with your transition. Two is take advantage of your transitional assistance programs of your service. Three is set up a LinkedIn profile. And four is clean up your social media. So come to terms with your transition. Now, w regardless of where you are, uh, maybe you have a year out, maybe you have six months out like I did, or maybe you're fully out of um, out of your uh, out of your service, you, you retired or you, you ended your contract. But the thing the thing that you have to remember the most is that you have to come to terms that life is going to be different, right? The community we have a strong veterans community, but it's for me at least it's not as strong as when you're with a tight knit unit that everybody knows what's going on, that you know you know that you can lean on somebody when you when you need to um, come to terms with the fact that the culture is different um, in different organizations that you that you may be interested in going to I like to think of uh, organizations like um, like when you go to an infantry unit and you move to another infantry unit you somewhat know what to expect right you know that there are certain there's certain languages there's uh, certain certain behaviors that would say okay yeah I'm in the combat arms unit they know what's going on but like if you go from a manufacturing company to another manufacturing company that could be completely two different ways of thinking two different different ways of how uh, the company culture is um, I had to learn very quickly about how uh, hierarchical organizations um, in the military are way different than how matrix organizations work um, whereas like you could be you could be the uh, the leader in the military because you have the rank on but you may you may have somebody that's junior that is the subject subject matter expert on a particular topic but senior leaders will listen to that person because they know that they're the expert um, you're gonna have to learn how to talk different you're gonna to have to learn a new leadership skills, soft skill development, empathy, emotional intelligence, stuff that um, when I was in the when I was in active service, they didn't really talk about that because empathy is not a thing in the Marines, right? So that is uh, that's something that you're gonna to have to come to terms with when you when you transition. You're gonna to have to get out, and things are gonna change. So where does that lead me now? Take advantage of the transitional assistance programs of your service. I think it's really important to not look at these programs as just a check in the box because it is annoying, right? You have to go in there and you have to sit down and you have to sit with a, a bunch of folks that are like on the last leg of their of their you know retirement or of their their term, and you know they just want to get get the heck out of there, but there's a treasure trove of information that's going to really help you. 
um, really help you understand how to build your resume, maybe some interview skills, how to do elevator pitch, um, you know, how to dress because it'll be different. So take it, take full advantage of these transitional assistance programs and, and learn as much as you can. Uh, this is not cybersecurity related, but it's going to help you in the long run because as we go further down this list, you'll see how you're going to be able to tailor the things that you've learned if you have a solid foundation to, to what you need to do to get into cybersecurity. The next thing I would like you to do is set up a LinkedIn profile, right? LinkedIn is the professional social media. I can't tell you how many times um, I have reached out to other veterans and asked questions and they're there to help help me. Um, the other part of LinkedIn is that it's really, it's really your online uh, resume, right? When recruiters start looking at you, um, they're gonna Google your name, they're gonna search your name, and what you want is your best foot forward uh, professionally because they want to see who you are, what you've done, who's endorsed you, you know, what, 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 are the, what are the things that you're into, uh, some of the organizations, what certifications you have, what, what your education is. And you list all of that, that out on LinkedIn. And it's a very, very powerful tool and it helps you get into contact with people that you wouldn't normally talk to. And it's global. It's not just limited to, to the US. So having a LinkedIn profile is huge. So I would invite you to set up your LinkedIn profile if you haven't done so already, because that's gonna be one of the main things that recruiters or hiring managers are gonna be looking at when they talk to you. Um, the other part is clean up your social media. I, you know, back in the day, they had a few social media um, outlets like, uh, you know, MySpace, everybody knows that, but there was another one called Friendster and yeah, I, I found that my accounts were still active and um, these are like when I was like 12, 13 years old, um, you know, just starting out with social media and just pictures of, of, of things that maybe, you know, just, just dumb pictures of myself. And what you don't want is when a recruiter or a hiring manager is searching for you, that they come across these... Um, these uh, these pictures or some of your statuses or some of your comments and uh, they look at that with um, with disdain because uh, maybe you didn't set your privacy settings right or n no one really wants to see you partying what you did on deployment um, and all of that stuff so I would I would say you know clean up your social media um, look at your privacy settings uh, look at the pictures that you have and if it's if it's something that, you know, you wouldn't want your your junior member, you know, seeing, it's probably something that um, your uh, hiring manager and recruiter will probably look or, or look down upon, frowned upon. So just make sure that you you clean up your social media, um, close close accounts that you don't need, um, you know, Twitter, Facebook, you know. Look at look at the things that you have all of a, all your accounts on, and just make sure that whatever you want to be put out there for for searching for anybody to look at that it's that's representing who you are. Uh, because as you start getting out and you're starting to put these resumes out there, you're exposing yourself, and people are going to start looking at you if you're a prime candidate. So. Um, this would be the first part, prepare yourself. So um, just review there, come to terms with your transition, take advantage of the transitional assistance programs of your service, set up a LinkedIn profile and clean up your social media. Okay, here's where the fun stuff starts coming down. Okay, exploring cybersecurity. What excites you about cybersecurity that you want to get into this field. One of the things that I always talk to my students about is is understanding that yes, yeah, cybersecurity is a lucrative career. You can make a lot of money um, going into this. I, I believe the average salary for a for a cybersecurity analyst is about 
I, I think 55 to 65 K. Awesome. And as you, as you grow in your field and you get into your, um, your expertise, uh, levels are, are getting up. You can, you can make six figures. That's great. Um, a tangible benefit. Uh, it's, it's, it's fun and it's challenging, but what I, what I always ask is why are you doing this now? Simon Sinek has, you know, the, the power of why, you know, why, why do companies that are successful, um, why are they successful? And it's because they understand why, like when we talk about cybersecurity and we talk about money, you know, that, you know, what you want to make is money. How are you going to do it? You're going to be in cybersecurity. But the next part that really, you really need to dig into is why do you want to do this? Right. That, that'd be the first thing I ask is, why do you want to do this? And I'll, I'll tell you from a personal experience, I look at it as um, when I, when I initially joined the Marine Corps is that um, they put these benefit tags in front of you and there's like technical skill, travel around the world and all these other different tags with different things on them. But they would have different colors to them. They would be black, they would be brown, but there would be these specific shiny ones. One said challenge, um, one said pride of belonging. And those would be the intangible things that, you know, they would say, hey, prioritize these. What do you, what do you think you, um, you want to do first? You know, um, what's important to you? And so, I didn't learn all of this until I was a recruiter, but yeah, they, they would put these shiny ones in front of you and you, uh, they would basically trick your mind in putting these um, ones on top. And we, we'd be talking about, um, you know, why is challenge important? Uh, why is pride of belonging important? So for me, what excites me about cybersecurity is that, you know, the, the reason I like it is because it's really mission oriented. Um, you have a job that you understand that there are good guys and then there's the adversary, right? And I think that's exciting. And the other part is that it's, it's always changing, right? It's challenging. Adversaries are coming up with new techniques, tactics, and procedures to get into some of the most secure spaces. And I think that's really interesting. So I, I want to learn how to to be one step ahead of them. So I, I think that's really interesting. So the, uh, uh, the one thing that I invite you to do again is figure out why you wanna do this. And it, it can't be for the money, it can't be for the prestige, right? Because uh, those things will go away. I want you to figure out why you wanna do this because the next part that we're gonna talk about is, is really looking at the things that really interest you. And this is where I would um, tell you to download the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. Um, it's the NIST NICE framework. And what it does is that it takes all of the different domains that exist in a cybersecurity organization, right? It takes all of these domains and it lists them out. And then what it does, it lists the roles out within each domain. So you would have different roles that are in different domains, and then you would have these roles have specific knowledge, skills, and abilities for you to, to really learn and understand so that when you look at the NIST NICE framework, that's how I kind of want you to, to look at it, is look at these Look at these domains, say, hey, this looks really interesting to me. Let me look at the different roles that are here. Let me look at the different knowledge, skills, and abilities or KSAs that are within these roles so that at the end of the day, you are going to look at four to five roles that you could see yourself pursuing, right? And then say, okay, out of these four or five roles, what is the priority that I would like to to learn this for, um, learn learn from. So, 
Like maybe you want to be a forensic investigator. Maybe you want to be a web application scanner, right? But the one thing I, I would invite you not to do is say that I want to be a hacker, right? Because like saying that you're a hacker is like saying, or um, saying that you're a hacker is like saying, hey, I want to be a scientist, right? That that doesn't really work. It's it's so much. There's so much stuff that you need to look at, and again, invite you to look at the NIST Nice framework. Write down four to five roles you could see yourself pursuing, and then we move on to the next step. And that's gap analysis. What do you need to get into those roles? So you've already listed down the four or five roles that you could see yourself pursuing, right? The next thing I would invite you to do is use Indeed to search for roles. And you'll notice that some of the KSAs don't really line up to some of these roles that you found on Indeed. And that's that's fine, that's completely fine. But what Indeed does um, it'll give you a clue as to what tools or what different KSAs for the specific role that you're that you're looking for that an organization needs. So use Indeed to search for the roles, understand uh, and do a comparison of of what the NIST Nice Framework publication is and what Indeed shows you, and and write those down because that'll be really important because this next step is what are the technical and education requirements that you need uh, for this particular role that you're interested in. So maybe you need to have a certain number of, um, of years doing packet analysis or you need to have a, a clear understanding of you know, a certain threat frameworks or specific compliance frameworks that you might have to adhere to, right? So maybe that's a little bit more of an education piece. Uh, maybe you, maybe they're requesting a certain amount of experience on a specific tool or a specific skill or ability. So those are things that you want to be able to list what you know and what you don't know, right? You list all of these things down, you do your comparison with KSAs and what you have indeed with Indeed, and, and you look at you look at all of these roles and you say, okay, right, if I were to apply for a job right now, what where where are my skills at? Um, and it's not to say that like maybe your number one priority you have like the the least amount of KSAs to get the role. But again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to narrow down like this huge industry um, into a specific four or five roles so you understand what KSAs you're looking for. And the way that I like to explain this is it's like saying, hey, we're going to go to the rifle range and we're going to shoot at targets. That's when it's like, that's when somebody is saying, hey, I want to get into cybersecurity. Well, what we're trying to do is say, okay, well, I know that you want to shoot at targets, but I want you to shoot at these four or five targets, and I just want you to at least hit one or two of them, right? We're trying to hit targets, hit paper, and eventually, as we get more experience, more education in the field, we'll be closer and closer to hitting black for several of those several of those targets to find your exact place. But how do we get there, right? We, we understand that we have four to five roles that we're trying to pursue. We understand that there are specific things that, um, that people are looking for in regards to technical and education requirements. And we know the things that we do know and we know what we don't know. The next part that we're gonna talk about is training. What do we need to fill those gaps. So what do we need to to get in order to fill these gaps, right? Um, you could do the traditional route. People look at 
college education. Maybe you want to get a degree in cybersecurity. There are um, schools of thought that say, no, you don't necessarily need that. Um, my my intuition and um, my, I guess, my, uh, my recommendation is to weigh the pros and cons with uh, what you really want to do. If you want to be in a management position later on, um, you might want to pursue some college education to better your chances for those roles because some of these roles require a bachelor's or maybe a master's degrees or a, a PhD, so depending on what your career goals are. But you don't necessarily need a, a college education in order to be in cybersecurity. It just really depends on, um, on where you see your five to 10 year outlook in your career. Uh, the next part is certifications. There is a plethora of certifications out there. And this is why I think it's super, super important that you understand that, you know, it's not just getting as many certs as you can, right? Um, certs are nice. They are a validation that you understand the knowledge that you have, um, that, you, that you could take, a, that you're a good test taker and that you get, uh, and that you could, you get a certification, but some of the certifications that you take tests for, they don't have, um, they don't have the skills or the abilities um, side that really show that you you really understand the the concepts and that you could actually execute these. So when we look at certifications, I want you to I want you to think about does this certification matter in the role that I want to be in, right? So um, a good a good rule of thumb is to look at those roles and look at those, not the KSAs, but look on Indeed and say, okay, are there any specific certifications that they're looking, they're looking for? Because that is what's going to set me apart from, from my peers if we are applying for these jobs. Are there are there required certifications or are there nice to have certifications that they're looking for? So as you're looking at those roles and you're looking at the certifications you should be training for, you know, um, that's, that's what you should be looking, looking to get and prioritize your study time in order to do that. Another thing that you want to look at too is you have so many, so many different sources of education that you don't need to go to a certifying body to get, you know, a certification for, but like if you need a specific skill, like um, understanding PowerShell or understanding Python or understanding the basics of programming, there are a lot, a lot of free classes to, to go and take, um, go to Udemy go to Coursera. There are some awesome, awesome resources out there. And there's really, really good, good instructors. And I would invite you to look at those kind of trainings to increase your your skill set and level up um, and and to really set yourself apart from your, uh, your peers. Um, training also comes down to on the job experience, right? If you don't have a job, um, in cybersecurity now, how do you possibly get any kind of on-the-job experience? Um, I think that there are uh, really good ways for those of you that are getting out, that have not quite gotten out yet. SkillsBridge is a great program for you to look at. It gives you an opportunity to uh, work with a corporation or a, a company that um, possibly has the role that you're looking for, and they give you, they give you the time to work with their pros, to get mentored by their pros, and uh, to to work in the industry that you want. And so when you uh, when you actually do apply for the job, you could say, yes, I've worked with X vulnerability scanner. I've worked with this GRC tool. I understand how to do that because. I had a project that I was on and this allowed me to, you know, look at code and I was able to decipher, you know, that there were several bugs in it that subsequently were corrected 
by the team. So trying to get that experience um, as you're getting out, there's opportunities for you there. Now, if you are already out and you're looking for those kind of opportunities, you may, if you're already in a job and you've already expressed interest that you want to be in cybersecurity, maybe you have an IT section that has a gap in um, cybersecurity or they have some mundane task that they don't really want to do or a report to be created or some kind of analysis that needs to be done. Find opportunities to exploit that will get you to where you need to be. So those opportunities are out there. Um, if you're still in school, I would invite you to intern at companies, right? Um, there's two year and four year programs where there's intern internship requirements. If those are not available, I would try to talk to your career counselors and ask to get some shadowing opportunities with, uh, with cybersecurity companies or cybersecurity professionals. Um, I, because I think it's really important that that everybody understands that there's so much experience out there and um, there's so much training opportunities that we can take advantage of. That that experience is going to be one of those things that you know certifications won't be able to provide. You know, college education won't be able to provide. You want to talk to people that are on the ground, brass tacks. They know what's going on. They could tell you, hey. You have textbook knowledge and then you have real world knowledge, you have street knowledge. This is how it really is. So it look for opportunities to get experience because that's definitely going to set you apart and really amplify um, what you've learned in college, what you've learned in um, the certification training, and it's really going to set you apart from everybody else. Okay, so um, I think we got the point there. Now let's talk about veteran career support programs. Okay, so with these, I'm looking at what programs are available to get training and experience. All right, so when we talk about training, training has to be paid for. So a, a few things that you, you want to take advantage of is um, your GI Bill benefits, if you haven't already used them, right? So look and see if you have a GI Bill benefits. Um, they will pay for your college education. They will pay for training, um, for certifications, and they'll actually pay for the exam. So you could um, get these certifications. So it's really important to understand if you qualify for GI Bill, you've already paid into it, right? So just go ahead and look at these opportunities to use your GI Bill um, to its full extent to to get um, not only the training and the education piece but also possibly a stipend so you could offset you know any kind of other costs that that may come um, down the line okay and another veterans affairs program that uh, you might want to take a look into is the veteran readiness and employment vr and e program and basically what it is is that the VA gives services to help with job training, employment accommodations, resume development and and job seeking skills um, and, and they provide coaching services for that. So those are some um, op awesome opportunities from the VA to get you the training that you need. Um, and, and I talked before a little bit about uh, the skills bridge program uh, that is very important for those of you that are getting ready to transition out and you you qualify for uh, whatever requirements those are in order to get uh, to be part of that program so look into that as well right you have a lot of different companies that are so supportive of veterans that I I can't tell you how how grateful and how awesome it is that that is in existence. I mean, uh, major corporations, Amazon, Microsoft, Cisco, all of these all of these companies want to see us succeed. And there's such a huge gap um, that you know they're they're looking not just to help but also to fill their ranks. So they have these specific academies. They have 
all of these trainings for you in order to get you in the pi in their pipeline or at least get you trained so you could be part of other people's part line, um, pipeline. So look into these programs. I'll share a, a list uh, towards the end of the, uh, of the presentation so, so that you have it. But take advantage of these, look them up, research, and you know, execute. That's, and that's the next topic. So when we talk about execute, we say, what do you need to do to get the job, right? And I've got, I've got these simple bullets here. Um, update and customize your resume. Network with veterans in cybersecurity and on social media. Go to cybersecurity conferences and apply. So with everything being said, you know, we, we know that you're going to need to work on your resume. You're going to need to take all of your military skills and it put it on a resume and make it make sense for the jobs that you want to apply for, for those four to five roles that you looked at from the NIST NICE framework that you, that you looked at the KSAs for, um, you want to put those on your resume. So you're going to have to update that to, your best, the, to the best of your ability, right? You want to be able to network with veterans in cybersecurity on social media. Again, LinkedIn is awesome because lots of veterans love to talk to the fact that they, they are veterans. Um, we're really proud of what we do. Um, and a lot of them are in cybersecurity. So there are multiple veterans that are in the space and they are willing to help you. There are great, great nonprofits out there. Um, Cyber Ohana Project, the one that, that I run, we, we help veterans. Um, there's VetSec that's also there. Um, they are one of the largest group of uh, veteran cybersecurity um, organizations in the nation. So look, uh, look at these and join, get involved, right? Go to these cybersecurity conferences. Uh, you're going to learn not just what the academics say, you're going to learn from firsthand from people that are down on the front lines that understand hey this is this is how it is right now with incident response this is how it is with our certain technologies and this is what it really is with uh, specific adversaries make sure you take the opportunity to continue to learn and again find different ways to network with other veterans at these conferences but also um, civilian counterpart, your civilian counterparts, because they're going to be your, your they're going to be your teammates. So, cybersecurity conferences are awesome to go to. You have so many, and there's, um, I mean, you have B sides that are local, um, and they're they're very, uh, I would say, intimate in regards to um, the crowd of of people that are there. Um, so you'll meet your local cybersecurity gurus. Then you have some big, big conferences that you might want to go to, like RSA and uh, Black Hat, DEF CON. Um, so take advantage of going to those, learning from r real, real, real uh, awesome people, real motivators um, and real leaders in the field. Take advantage of those opportunities to do that. And then when you, when you get to the point that you are confident in your knowledge, skills, and abilities, um, that you could, you know, competently talk about these things and what you want to do, and you're able to explain your why in cybersecurity, um, you, what, why you want to do these things in cybersecurity, apply for these jobs. Um, and I invite you not to just shotgun, let me apply let me click on easy apply and just apply to whatever really take the time to put your resume together to speak to the specific role of the organization really take the time to write an awesome cover letter that speaks about who you are and what you bring to the organization and what this allows to show the organization is not only that you are a veteran that you know your stuff you know why you're doing it and why they should hire you so with that being said, we talked about a lot, a lot. And I know it's going so fast with, uh, with everything, but I, I don't have a lot of time. So just to go over and recap, 
The first thing we need to do is prepare ourselves. How are we getting ready to enter civilian life? Next, we explore cybersecurity. This is where that NIST NICE framework comes in. Get those four to five roles you see yourself pursuing. Figure out what your why is. Talk about what excites you about cybersecurity. Gap analysis. What do you need to do in order to get to these roles, right? You know that you need to list what you know and what you don't know. You need to talk about what are your technical and education requires for these roles and do that comparison between Indeed and the NIST NICE Framework publication. Then you need to get that training, right? You need to get that training, regardless if it's college education, certifications, different experience, we need to make sure that those roles, we have the trainings uh, available to us and that we start moving towards getting those things in order to get the job that we want. Um, and there are different ways to support our training initiatives and different things that the, the, the Veterans Affairs gives to us and other organizations gives to us um, to support our goals. So we talked about the GI Bill, uh, the GI benefits. We talked about the VR and E program, and we talked about the multiple private sector sponsored veteran programs that are out there. Uh, we just need to be able to look for them and see if they fit our current agenda. And lastly, what do you do? What do you need to do in order to get the job? We need to execute. So. Okay, Update you. your resume. Network with vets in cybersecurity. Go to cybersecurity conference. Yeah. And once out. you're there, apply. So, again, my name is Wilson Bautista Jr. Um, I'm part of the Cyber Ohana project, and I invite you to look us up: www.cyberohanaproject.org. And and connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts and. Again, I, I love to help vets. Um, our project is all about helping vets. So if you, um, if you need anything, let me know. And that's it, signing off. See y'all later. Okay, uh, can y'all hear me? Am I back? Yep. Cool. Um, that was great. Um, really loved all parts of that. And for folks who are both transitioning out of the military, and then I think also maybe folks who are already vets or have been for some time, I found a lot of it, uh, value in, in hearing that. Um, but let's move on to our next uh, short speaker, unless I think actually Wilson might be on the line. I don't know, Wilson, do you have any final thoughts? If you're able to unmute. Yeah, no, um, if you if you guys have any questions, please let me know. I'm definitely here to help every one of you. And I, I look forward to connecting with you on LinkedIn. Thanks again for having me. Great, and thank you so much for the talk. That was great. Um, OK, so for the next uh, quick talk, it's a short one, a 10 minute uh, talk with Tom Arsland. Um, he's an active duty US Navy uh, Master Chief Petty Officer, not same as Halo, um, and the board chair and CEO at VetSec uh, Inc. Um, he's been on active duty for 19 years, serving as a nuclear powered trained electronics technician on submarines and has traveled from the equator to the North Pole. He has a passion for uh, cybersecurity and helping to make sure no veteran uh, goes unemployed. So without further ado, uh, Tom. Hey, thanks everybody. Um, while Jen pulls up the slides, I just want to say thanks to HackerOne for having us and thanks for Wilson for that last presentation. That was awesome. Um, if this doesn't load quite right, I can share my screen out, Jen. But um, really today, I just want to talk for just a couple minutes about what VetSec is and what our mission is. Um, so our vision is a world where no veteran pursuing information security goes unemployed. Um, and before I delve into the slides, I really just want to say, uh, you know, as I am also still active duty Navy, uh, what I'm saying is, is my personal opinion and the opinion of VETSEC, not the DOD or, or my company. Um, next slide, please, Jen. 
Um, VetSex history. So we were founded in 2018. Many of you know Heath Adams, the cyber mentor. He was one of the original founders of VetSec. Um, we started it as a Slack channel for veterans and very quickly became a registered 501c3 nonprofit. Um, over the course of 2019, a lot of formalizations happened in VetSec. We turned over to a full board, all volunteers, all uh, veteran members, and grew rapidly to about 1,500 plus members. Um, and the first board kind of began outreach with the InfoSec community. This past spring, we held VetSecCon Junior, which was an internal conference for our members to talk about transition, resume assistance, mentorship, and technical aspects of cybersecurity. Um, and then my board took over in June of 2020, and we started building partnerships with organizations that were willing to donate their resources to help veterans. Um, Hack the Box, Offensive Security, and a few others have donated graciously their time and resources to help our community out. Um, and then this fall in uh, October, we held VetSecCon 2020, which was our first public conference. We hope to do that each year. We had three tracks, um, humanity, technical, and transition, focusing on the human side of cybersecurity, mental health, and everything else that we deal with in the veteran and the InfoSec community. The technical track is exactly what it sounds like. And then the transition track was, again, VA benefits, um, how to help those, those military members transition out. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what are we? We're a nonprofit. We focus on networking, mentorship, education, and professional growth for both current serving military members and veterans in the IT and cybersecurity fields. We accept any veteran as long as they made it to their first duty station from any of the 14 eyes countries. Obviously, our focus is mainly in the United States, but we want to share those resources with anybody that has served their country in that capacity. Uh, next slide, please. So our, our biggest offering is our Slack community. You can go to veteransec.com slash Slack and submit an application to join. And one of the board members will do a little OSINT to make sure that you are a military member and then get you access. That is where we share 99% of our resources as well. Uh, the second thing is a partnership with an organization called Battles in Binary. Um, recognizing the full breadth of what veterans go through, we hold a bi-weekly mental health chat organized by one of our own members, and we invite speakers that can talk about different aspects of mental health and, and kind of get us all talking about our feelings a little bit. Resume assistance. There are recruiters in our Slack that are were veterans, are veterans that are donating their time to help people go through their resumes and give them advice. Mentorship as well, same thing. Um, mock interviews, uh, really a lot of our guys talk about what they went through with the interview process at different organizations and help each other out. It's all about those veteran members giving back. Uh, partnerships and learning resources, I'll touch a little bit on the next slide and then the conference as I discussed. Um, our partnerships right now span through eLearn Security, uh, Fortinet, we are a Fortinet Security Academy, so any of the NSE certifications are free to our members. We gave a scholarship out this year to two of our members where we pieced together donations in kind from Hack the Box, Offensive Security, and CyberSec Labs, and we have two of our members working through their OSCP right now. Really, we're trying to find any avenue that we can provide to help members get into cybersecurity and then upskill. Virtual Hacking Labs uh, is a country a company over in the Netherlands that donates vouchers every month to our members, and they've been just an amazing resource to help us out. Um, Kaspersky donated five seats for Yara training, and then all of our stories of our members that are that are wanting to get their name out of there, out there, and talk about VetSec. If you go to cyber.media. Um, you'll find an interview with me and a bunch of the VETSEC members about their stories and how they got out of the military and how they transitioned. Um, so, so what's next for VETSEC and where are we going from here? Um, we are over 2,400 members now, but we want to go way more than that. There's about 100,000 military members each year that separate from the military. And I know a, a decent chunk of those want to get into cybersecurity. So we're trying to find ways to get our name out there to the transition assistance programs, the military-based leadership, the family resource centers, and starting to use some Google advertising. Our increased partnerships, I'm proud to announce this week that we became a CompTIA authorized partner academy, so we can provide vouchers to our members, significantly reduced cost. Um, and then our mentorship program, 
So right now my board is working on developing a foundations learning path where somebody who's a veteran joins VetSec and they want to get into cybersecurity, but they're not really sure what to what to go do. There's so many resources out there on the internet, some good, some bad. You know, these boot camps that cost thousands of dollars that they, you know, they're trying to to piece all this stuff together and they don't really have the financial resources to do it or just knowing what to go look at. So we're building a foundations learning path that'll get any of our members through basically CompTIA's Security Plus. And we're trying to do that completely free to our members or at a very low cost. Once that's done, our goal is to pair them up with a mentor in one of the specializations in cyber, whether it's penetration testing, web app, bug bounty, uh, blue team, GRC, you know, you name it, and explain to that member what that specialization is. If that's the way they want to go, then providing them some resources in a building block approach to help them upskill into that field. And really my hope is that anybody who's in the military or who wants to get into cyber that is a veteran can go through our foundation's learning path and walk straight into an entry level job. So we're working with organizations like Booz Allen and a few other employers who are gonna look at our learning paths and certify them really to say, hey, if you complete this, we're gonna get you an interview at our company. Um, we're continuing to facilitate limited vouchers and we have discounts as well. Um, INE and eLearn Security is one of those that provides us a pretty significant discount for our members. So kind of to wrap it up a little bit, um, that is VetSec as a whole. I'm going to be here in the Discord and uh, in the Zoom chat to answer any questions anybody has, but please, uh, we can't do it without the military here, right? The military is what we're all about. Please spread the word of our organization. Um, we do this on a pretty small budget, just a few thousand dollars a year. We're a completely volunteer organization. And really the more members we have, the stronger the organization comes and the more we can give back. So last, I just wanna say thanks to everyone here for your service. Thanks to Hacker One for having me. And I really appreciate it. Um, JC in the channel, I see uh, you mentioned DEF CON. Uh, that's a VET CON, which is a slightly different organization trying to do good work as well. But uh, that is VetSec in a nutshell. Thank you all for having me and I really appreciate it. And I'll be here and in the Discord to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, that was great. And uh, I'll be actually clicking that link to join uh, your org as well soon. So hopefully there's enough OSINT out there where you can validate me. Um, so the next uh, speaker that we have up uh, is uh, Matt uh, Kylie, I believe I'm saying it right. Uh, if not, please correct me. Uh, he's a cybersecurity res uh, uh, practitioner, hacker, and instructor. Uh, by day, he builds cybersecurity training labs and content for professionals to practice their offensive and defensive skills. Um, by night, he publishes blog posts, records videos, and does technical conference talks under the uh, handle of Husky Hacks. Uh, he's uh, OSCP and ECPPT certified and has a bachelor's degree uh, in IT from the um, Northeastern University and a graduate certificate in cybersecurity from Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, so without further ado, um, are you on the line and can we check your mic? I am here, sir. Mic check. Good. Sounds good. All right. Fantastic. All right, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roro. Ra, Yut, happy birthday. And uh, to you as well, Wilson, happy birthday. I hope you gents go find a piece of cake somewhere today. Um, all right. Let's, let's set this off. How are we doing in chat, everybody? Oh, uh, well, we got to do this right. Hold on. A three and a two and a one. And there I am. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Um, how are we doing, guys? Thank you so much for having me here. Raw indeed, Carlos. Doing good. Elgar, we got Brian. Verdun Archimedes, coolest name I've ever heard. Raw. Um, we got Ian Murphy, who was a Royal Marine. So uh, go find some tea and crumpets today, sir, for you. Um, hey guys. Wow. I am so excited to be here. It's, it still doesn't even feel real. got the nerves a little bit. It's okay. Still here for you. You got so, this. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Matt. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, Ro, I, um, I, I, I'm so happy to be here. Um, what you guys are about to experience, this isn't so much a talk today. Uh, it's a, it's a hacking workshop. Um, I want you guys to come along with me. You guys are going to be my ride along in, <clears throat> excuse me, in a, uh, a technical hacking on hands-on keyboard 
practical workshop that I've put together for you guys called the O course. Um, and uh, let's just get this up and running. You should be seeing my screen at this point. If I could just get confirmation of that. Yep, we can see it. Fantastic. All right. So like I said, my name is Matt Kiley. Uh, I go by the handle Husky Hacks. I'm a cybersecurity practitioner with about eight years, coming on nine years of experience in the field at this point. Primarily a red teamer, but I come from a strong blue side background as well. Um, and so this is the O course, an OWASP top 10 obstacle course for beginners. So let's just do a quick uh, who am I in Cali. And so when I think about who I am, what it really comes down to, uh, more than I would say anything else, is that I'm a guy that tries to learn every, every single day. Um, and uh, that, that's really what it comes down to as a practitioner in the field, as somebody who um, is in cybersecurity kind of for the, for the long haul at this point. Um, I try to learn every, every single day. I try to do three things really well. I try to learn things. I try to teach things. I try to build things. And if uh, at any given point in the day, if I can do even two of those three things, it's a good day for me. And if I can do all three, awesome. Um, so, but in any case, some of the other stuff about me, um, well, let me make sure I get the chat up here so I can, I can talk to you guys. Some of the other stuff about me, um, I, uh, I'm a recent cat dad. Uh, if you can see that little, little guy right there, his name is Cosmo. And uh, yeah, he's a little black, black and white tuxedo cat. So he's always dressed for the party, but he never tells me where it is, but that's okay. Um, so I'm also a mountaineer. I've summited Mount Kilimanjaro. I've done a lot of the New Hampshire whites. I'm from Massachusetts originally. So I kind of grew up, uh, up, up in the, in the, uh, Northern part of Massachusetts where it was pretty easy to get up to New Hampshire and go mountain climbing. And I did one one twentieth of the Appalachian trail. I see Brian says my AT dreams got crushed this year too. That's incredible. That's so funny that you, I would meet somebody else who tried to do the AT this year. Um, so the background there, of course I did, um, I started hiking the AT. I quit my job early this year in February. And I started hiking the AT, uh, from Georgia heading North. Um, and I started in February and, uh, yeah, I mean, we all know how that kind of ended up. Um, so I'm back and I actually just recently went out and section hiked a bit of the New York section, but unfortunately my AT dreams have to be on uh, post they're postponed right now for a bit, but I'll get back out there. I will. Um, and so, yeah, so today's veterans, uh, well, tomorrow's, I should say veterans day today is, uh, my unofficial, my favorite unofficial holiday, which is the Marine Corps birthday. So, uh, happy birthday to all Marines, uh, past and present, um, to all veterans in the audience, of course, veterans transitioning active duty guys, please stay safe. Um, stay healthy. I wish the best for you and your families as well. And thank you for being here. Um, my background is that I was in the Marine Corps for five years. Um, I was a special access program uh, security officer. I did intel work for the F-35 squadron. First operational, uh, the MFA-121 the Green Knights, which is what you see there in the middle of the, uh, the screen there. And so that unit actually moved out to Japan now, uh, but they used to be in Arizona. So while I was uh, there with them, I was serving intel and, and some other different things. And I did IT support as well for the F-35s. So I like to say that the genesis of my career, um, you know, Wilson was talking a little bit about... Um, the, uh, the, you know, the, kind of the, where, where we find the genesis of your career in cybersecurity. Mine was that triangle between special access program security, intelligence work, and IT. And if you kind of go to the center of that triangle, that's uh, cybersecurity, isn't it? Well, so it felt kind of natural to go right, right into that. Um, so that was, I served from 2012 to 2017, and then I got out, went to Northeastern, uh, have my degree in information technology, uh, from Northeastern University, and I have half of a master's degree right now from RIT. Uh, I did cash out the advanced certificate, so I have uh, like a graduate certificate in cybersecurity from RIT. Um, but I, I don't have the master's yet, but I'm getting there. I'll get close. And so some of my um, uh, certifications, I'm OSCP and ECPPT certified. Quick disclaimer before we begin on this one, and then we can launch right into the course. Um, my current employer is SimSpace, and they're not affiliated or sponsoring this workshop. And so what I want to say for anyone who has, um, you know, uh, just to, to kind of gauge the skill levels in here, uh, this lab that I'm, I'm going to present and you guys are going to do along with me is actually made for beginners. Um, if the four things on the screen right now seem way too easy to you, or maybe it's, it's something that, you've, that you feel you could do pretty easily, um, hey, stick around, uh, you know, hack them. Um, and, and once you're done with that, come talk to me. I have a ton of other lab resources that I can give you that are a little bit more um, in-depth and intense uh, and maybe a little more advanced. But so like cross-site scripting, 
SQL injection, uh, XXD, and uh, API brute forcing. If those things sound a little a little on the easy side, I can recommend some stuff for you um, that we that'll get you up into the advanced section. So, okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the O course. And this is a workshop lab that I put together for you guys uh, at the request of uh, Jen and Ben um, from HackerOne to put on and really get some some like hands-on keyboard technical stuff with uh, web application penetration testing specifically. So like I said, my a little bit about my background, I'm primarily a red teamer. Um, like you saw, I'm OSCP and ECPPT. So I have uh, a, a decent amount of experience with breaking into and testing and, um, and assessing web applications. And so HackerOne, best platform in the world to do, you know, go find bug bounty programs and start to hack into and break into web applications for good, right? You, uh, you break into these web applications, you find little ways to poke at them just right to, to get them to do something that maybe they weren't intended to do. Uh, and then you say, hey, I found something. I submit the report. You can get money for that. You can get accolades for that. It's fantastic stuff. The crux, the, the skill underpinnings of bug bounty program are web application and mobile application assessment penetration testing. And this is what I would present to you today that if you don't have any experience in those areas, I'd like to present this lab to you. And maybe you can walk away with uh, some of the skills needed to start in this bug bounty uh, journey that you're going on. This stuff takes many, many years of experience to get good at. I don't expect you to walk away the actual bug bounty master today. Um, I, I can't necessarily make you that. But what I could do if you have no experience in this is to incite a, uh, you know, fan, get, get a spark going and fan that into a flame. And maybe someday down, down the road, you, you become the bug bounty master. And then so that's what I would like for you guys. Uh, but if you want that, the journey starts today. And the journey starts with, uh, a good understanding of fundamentals and some practical skills. And then you just, you know, listen to your intuition and go from there. All right. So a couple things before we start up with the workshop that you see on the screen right here, there is a student guide available. Um, so you can go to the student guide. There are seven, seven pages of uh, lecture material and six videos, I want to say I, I recorded six videos, put them on YouTube. They're all unlisted. So you can just go to the student guide and you can go watch the YouTube videos from there. And they have um, walkthroughs and uh, a practical demonstration of the tools that we're going to use with this. Um, and so you can go there and, and you can follow along while you have your lab set up as well. So just make sure that you go check out the student guide. That's open source on GitHub. Uh, some Another uh, kind of admin point that I should mention. If you guys wanted to participate today, but you're like, ah, Cali's just not working. I can't really get it up and running. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it's not working out for me. Don't worry about it. The lab and the student guide are both open source on GitHub under my uh, GitHub account, Husky Hacks. They're staying up there. I'm not taking them down after this, uh, this presentation. So just hang out uh, with us and just watch. Uh, I can answer questions. Um, and then when you have time, go grab your Cali box, fix it up, get it up and running, and then go grab that lab, uh, snap it in, and uh, hack to your heart's content. So, so in any case, uh, student guides up there. It's got videos and, and lectures. Uh, again, while you're going through this, be on the lookout for uh, the flags. The flags are going to look like that. They've got the curly braces and the underscores like that. Um, make sure that you're kind of noting down which flags you find. This is just for fun, but uh, you know, it might, it might make a little, there are also some Easter egg flags out there too. So just going through the course doesn't necessarily mean that you found every single flag. So keep your eyes open, start to use some of the skills that you're acquiring in this lab. And uh, you might be surprised at what you find. I'll just put it that way. Uh, and when you're finished, if you think you have all the flags, uh, DM me in discord, send me a LinkedIn me message or something like that. Um, and uh, I'll let you know if you got them all. Again, this stuff's just for fun, um, but you know, it just it adds a little a little extra some Easter eggs and stuff. And of course, have fun and try to get the most out of this lab. Okay, do I have any questions before we begin? I know that was a lot. Um, latest virtual box build. Hopefully, it'll be good enough right now. You should be fine if you have Cali in the latest virtual box build. Should be totally fine. Uh, can we get a copy of the slide deck? Absolutely. Does Cosmo the Cat have an Instagram? I'm not going to say no. I'm going to say not yet. Um, let's see. 
I'll answer, I see some like some, some career kind of questions and stuff. I'll answer those because there's going to be a, a bit of a, you know, kind of dead, dead air to fill because we're going to be working through the, the workshop self-paced. Uh, I'll, I can do like an AMA or answer questions and stuff in that. So, okay, cool. So next slide I'm going to put up is just the instructions on how to actually get this thing set up. And what I wanted to do is do this live in front of you guys the first time, and then I'll leave this slide up so that you can grab the instructions and, and snap in the lab and it'll be a okay. So. So here is the O course. Uh, you can still see my screen, right? I think that that should be, it should be a screen share, not just the window, right? Yep, we can. Fantastic. All right. So here is the GitHub page. You're going to, um, if you're not kind of familiar with Git and, and GitHub and how this works, I have written and, and committed to this page all of the code that is responsible for building this web application for you to hack. It is right here. And you're going to grab this and clone it from the GitHub source and build it right locally inside of your own Kali box. So it's completely self-sufficient. It doesn't re require you. All you really need is an internet connection to do that. And so the other side of this that I mentioned earlier is the OCourse student guide. A little bare bones, I'll give you that, but uh, it's, it's, um, it's got all of the, uh, the stuff that you're going to need. It's, it's got the requirements in here, uh, the objectives. We should go over the learning objectives real quick because that's in the business that, you know, learning objectives are pretty important. Um, you're going to be doing four, really five things, but four, four main things uh, in this lab uh, practical exercise. I want you guys at the end of this to walk away from this course, having learned what cross-site scripting is and how to identify it and exploit it identify and exploit SQL injection points with v, uh, via both manual and um, uh, automatic like SQL map, uh, SQL injection methods. We're gonna identify XML externity, excuse me, XML external entity uh, injection. We're gonna identify, oh God, if I could talk. We're gonna identify an XML external entity and inject into it to uh, get at some of the files of the underlying uh, web server. And then we're going to go looking for, identify, and brute force an API, and then make certain crafted requests to that API to get it to spit out uh, information. If none of what I just said makes any sense and you're saying, what, is this, what language is this guy speaking? Don't even worry about it. The uh, student guide and the videos are going to walk you through that. So don't uh, worry about that. And then so right here has the, um, the uh, instructions to set up. So. So I'm gonna do that live for you right in front of your very eyes. Right here, I have a fresh install of the latest build of Kali Linux. So we're gonna log in Kali and Kali for a, um, that's the default credentials on the latest builds of Kali Linux. And I will disrobe my hacker hoodie. Okay. So. We are at the main screen of Kali Linux here. I can close this up. So what we're gonna do per the instructions of the lab is we're going to uh, change directories to opt. You don't have to really do this. I just like to install things that are not um, built into Kali uh, specifically in the opt directory. Uh, opt is optional. Uh, so it can be software that you install uh, just that's not part of the standard builds. So we're gonna change directories into opt. You can even keep this on the desktop. It, it's really not. Uh, that big of a deal wherever you put this. But in any case, wherever you put it, you're going to sudo git clone. And then you're going to take the URL for the O course, which is https colon slash slash github.com slash husky hacks slash o dash course. Copy this, paste that in and hit go. It will prompt you for credentials because you're running something with sudo, Kali, and it will clone. Fantastic. If you do an ls here, you're going to see that you have the O course now in the opt directory. So far, so good. Does anybody have any problems so far if you're following along with me? All right. So far, so good. Next thing you're going to do, cd change directories into the O course directory. And you can just hit O and hit tab and it'll tab auto complete. And then you can do an LS and you should be in the directory that has all, it has the install script and all the rest of the uh, code that's required to run this. So next you're going to sudo python three install dot pi. 
you must run this with sudo. It actually won't even let you if you don't use sudo to run it and go ahead and hit enter and just follow the prompts on the screen. At this point, it's just going to say press enter to continue. I throw some ASCII uh, flare text in here. If you are using a screen reader um, and you'd like a more accessible install script, you can do the dash dash accessible flag with this install script and it'll take away a lot of the ASCII text. So the screen reader does not go haywire when you uh, try to pass the install script through it. So, but in any case, hit enter. Husky Axe production in collaboration with Hacker One, the O course and OWASP top 10 course for beginners. This is going to set up everything that you need for your lab. Uh, primarily, if you have a fresh install of Kali Linux, it will not have Docker installed on it. This install script is going to uh, add Docker to the local repository of Kali and then install it and, and build it. Curiously enough, Kali Linux does have Docker Compose. Um, so that's already installed in most, but it does a check for that anyway, just to make sure and installs it if you don't have it. And just let this run and we can just kind of relax for a second. So this is installing Docker at this point. If you don't understand, if you've never seen Docker before, um, don't worry about it. That's a lesson for another day. Docker's just, it's an awesome little way to package up uh, an application that you want and be able to send it uh, somewhere that you uh, want and run it anywhere you, you need. So in any case, um, we're checking for Docker Compose. Docker Compose is installed. I put a little uh, yellow text here. Kali does come installed with one of the tools that we're going to be using, which is Burp Suite. Um, the community edition that is installed uh, standard in Kali is good. Um, the latest one is better. So I would recommend that if you, um, I think we got a little bit of hot mic here. If you could just please mute, it just, it goes right up in my ear and it scrambles my brain. Thank you so much. Um, where was I? If, uh, if you would like a better version of Burp Suite, um, you can install the one and I give you the link right there and you can just follow the uh, directions. And so in any case, once you're here, you press enter and this is actually going to build the Docker application for you right in front of your very eyes. And so we can just hang out for a second. Do I have any questions so far? There is an even newer version of Burp 2020.11, FYI. Yes, and I think it's got a bunch of improvements. It has the built-in proxy um, web browser, which is like just absolutely awesome. Um, I'm going to show you guys in the videos of the course. Uh, there's a tool that you can install to make it so that you don't need the, the built-in proxy uh, that comes with Burp, or the built-in proxy browser, I should say. Um, and uh, it's, it's a tool I've been using since my OSCP days, and it's a, it's a fantastic little tool, so. Uh, any issues using the Kali OVA with regards to system resources uh, may be easier for some to use. I don't think so. This is all, once Kali is up and running, all the rest of the installation is down to Docker and just getting something off the internet from GitHub. So an internet connection and the install scripts are all that you need. So you should be good. Uh, the new version is not linked in my in my uh, student guide, I don't think, because I teach how to use uh, an alternate tool, which is Foxy Proxy. So, um, but I can get that for you guys real fast here. Burp Community Edition. In fact, the install link was right here. I will copy this. There you go. All right, now it looks like the Docker application is done. You will know that the Docker application is done when you see three things go across the screen. The first is this PHP my admin right here. The second is this web DB. The third and final one is this uh, www. These are the three Docker containers that are being stood up uh, when you build this application. And web DB has a whole bunch of stuff to do. So web DB will eventually settle down and once you see that there's no more uh, text scrolling across the screen when with WebDB down here, you are good to launch into the course. And the way you do that on a standard fresh install of Kali Linux, open up a web browser, HTTP colon slash slash. Usually this is 172.17.0.1. And if the demo gods are kind to me today, this will work. Yes, love it when that happens. <laughs> All right, so if you see this screen that you're looking at right now 
and POV, you are at the start of the Marine Corps obstacle course. Uh, you are ready for the, uh, the course. Please continue at your own pace. Uh, read the text that's in here. Play around with it. Remember, this is a hacking, a web application penetration testing course. So I'll leave you with a few things and then I'll hang out to answer questions and whatnot. Number one is that the mindset that you should approach this with is one of, and this will, will carry you through if you're red teaming Active Directory, if you're red teaming um, you know, uh, different uh, environments or web applications, never ask, what does this do? Always, always ask and approach it from a, what can I make this do standpoint? And you'll see what I mean when you start to go through the course. Um, and also just uh, try to view this one. This might be a little easy uh, for some of you, just try to view it from kind of a learning perspective, right? Um, try to find the the uh, areas that you may be weaker on and maybe improve those. Um, if you fly through this course again, just DM me. I can I can get you some other resources. Um, so that that's what I'll leave you with, guys. And I'll be uh, answering questions at this point. And I'm scrolling through the chat. So does anybody have any other problems at this point? Uh, let me see. The very first thing I did. Let me see. Uh, just got to get to the top here. Okay, I'm lost already. The command prompt is asking for a GitHub username and password. You should not need, uh, the, the repository is open. You do not need a GitHub username and password. If you follow the prompts, uh, change directories to opt, and then sudo git clone, and then just the URL of the GitHub repository, that should be all you need. It should drop right in there. Make sure I'm, I'm catching up on, on chat here. I'll try to get to the, the bottom here in a second, guys. I spelled navigation wrong in the guide. You got me. <laughs> if I could just confirm, I think uh, Susan was having trouble uh, cloning the repository and getting it stood up. Do we, um, do we have, are we working on that? And is that, do you still need assistance there? I'm just working on it in the background. Just carry on, I'll catch up on the recording. Okay, sure, yeah. Yeah, like I said, this is, this is gonna be open source. I just wanna make sure that if, if the accessing of the repository itself is the problem, then the fact that it's open source is not gonna help. Um, we just, we gotta make sure that you can, uh, but yeah, please let me know. I can I can walk you through and, and see what where we I can even like um I don't know if we want to like share screens in the in the recorded session. And if you're not comfortable with that, that's fine. Um but um Yeah, so I've just typed it in again and it started asking me for the password for Kali. So I'll Oh the oh the password for Kali. Oh no, that's fine. That's fine. The password for Kali is K-A-L-I. Yeah, it's all just frozen. Don't worry, I'll catch up in the recordings. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> just let me know. Let me know if that uh, if that works. Catching up on some private messages here. Yep, one thing to know is you can copy paste the commands out of uh, of the github.io page. That, that is correct. Um, how long am I staying online? My time on station ends at 3 p.m. today, Eastern time, which would be, um, what is that, uh, 12 noon uh, Pacific yep, time, 12, I believe. Yep, 12 p.m. Pacific time. And then I will be, I got to go back to my, my actual job, <laughs> but, um, uh, but I can uh, be in the Discord and um, I will be in the chat of the Zoom call uh, to help out with anything else. Time on station, 30 mics. All right, let's see. Yep, for sorry, try again. If, you, if, you're, um, if you're running any commands in Kali and it's hanging or you need to start over, control C is going to give the command to the, the terminal prompt to just stop what you're doing and you can start over from there.
a bit of an AMA question. How did you get into cyber education? Was it always a passion uh, you pursued in this track? Or did you have a specific moment experience in time that led you down the path? Um, I've probably always been a, I've had a, a bit of a, um, like a draw to education, I guess. I actually used to be a camp counselor um, a long, long time ago. Uh, so uh, doing theater arts. So teaching kids how to kind of like act on stage. Um, so that was like one of my earliest kind of educational gigs, I guess. Um, and then uh, my current role is content architect and instructor for the content that we put out at SimSpace. And so I got to marry kind of my two, my two passions, which are uh, instructing, teaching and building ranges and um, setting up courses. So it became a really nice, nice way to combine both of those. All right, let's see, we got new chat messages. Uh, my Discord ID is Matt Kylie with the pipe sign and then Husky Hacks. So I am, if you're in the Hacker HackerOne uh, Veterans and Security, I will post right now. And that's me right there. So after step two, it says sudo password with Kali. When I put Kali, nothing happens. Um, can you please post the command, the full command that you used? Oh, thanks, Jen. Yeah, that's it right there. Can you please, Chris, post the command that you've been using um, to do step two? And in fact, I forgot. I'm so sorry, everybody. I will put these instructions back on the screen. Looks like uh, Dennis is having a little trouble unzipping. Um, Dennis, can I confirm, are you working on Kali Linux and have you unzipped the file so that all of the, uh, the file contents are in a directory? Because there, there's a way that you can, it, got to unzip, yes to Kali. Go in to that unzipped directory and then um, in the main area of that directory before you go into any other, um, any other folders run this command. Oh, sorry. I sent that to somebody privately. Sudo docker compose up. If you're in, um, if you go and open a terminal and go to that uh, folder and run that command, it will boot up the, uh, the docker lab for you. How else are we doing? Has anybody been able to get to the main page at this point? All right, we got somebody who got the first flag. Outstanding. All right. And so, yep, like I said, I can uh, stay here, answer any questions. Again, if you're having any trouble, please shoot me a message in the DMs. I've got like three chats open at this point, so I'm just trying to field all of them at the same time. Um, Hey, Ben from Acker One here. I'm going to actually throw in an IP address in the chat. If you're having problems setting up your own, you're welcome to use that IP address to um, play with the script that Matt has put together for us. Nice. So here's the IP address. Um, you can just browse to it. It will give you access to the instance that we have spun up. Ben, just thank you so much. I can make another one go up immediately. That is awesome. Yep, that looks like it. <laughs> We'll see. Uh, we'll we'll just uh, have to make sure that the kind of back end stuff is still functioning in the in the um, in the intended manner. But that looks like totally fine. So you can give that a shot. 
um, just treat the where the uh, in the instructions it'll say you know input the IP or 172.17.0.1. Just use if you're using the VPS, just use that IP in its place, and you should be okay. Uh, Dennis, can you do a PWD command in the command line, please? <laughs> can I mute Zoom? I can't watch the YouTube guy. Please do. Go ahead. <laughs> So actually, I'm going to work on, let me grab my Cali over to the side, and I'm going to work on the, uh, the VPS that Ben set up. And let's see if I can recreate some of the lab steps. I'm firing up a uh, burp right now. And in fact, if, uh, if you guys need the instructions still on the screen, I can put those back up, but I actually want to, uh, bring over my Cali and we can do some of this, uh, at the same time. So, so just, if you need the instructions again, just ask me, I can bring those back up. Fantastic. All right. Let's get the intercept up and on. And we'll do one of these guys. Looking good. Send that to repeater. Actually, we don't need to do that yet. We will go to the drop intercept. We'll go to, we got cross site scripting. We got XXE. We got API disclosure. And we've got SQL map. All right. If I do this and the, um, and the, the backend response, then we should be good with the VPS. And if you're following along with me, this is a big spoiler alert for the SQL injection part of the course, but hey, that's how it goes. All right, what? let's get that SQL map up. SQL map, the king of SQL injection tools. We'll do uh, dash r page dot rec level, crank it all the way up equals five. We've got risk, crank it all the way up equals three. And that's dash dash risk. Let's see how it goes. Looking good. All right, let's see how we doing in chat. I don't know what's going on, but it's exciting. That's what I feel when I hack all the time. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, like Ben just said, if you want a treat, if you've got the Dockerize component up and running, so in the background here, um, this is my Docker instance. If you run SQL map against this, just watch what happens. It's an absolute blast. And I would uh, caveat that um, if you're ever in a blue side uh, position and you see some of these logs coming across, the length and complexity of SQL map queries is one of the most um, interesting and terrifying things that you can watch come across your logs. So I'll just leave you with that. All right, let's see. Yep, we're gonna try random integers. We should have Boolean or based injection and time-based blind SQL. 
And I think it's going to be okay. Username is vulnerable, looking good. There we go. All right. I have confirmed that the VPS at that IP address has a functioning backend. You can bombard that with all of your hacking, uh, your hacking skills and uh, hopefully it holds and uh, that'll, that'll help you guys out. So if you're having problems, again, Ben, thank you so much for that. Um, the VPS IP address that he posts in there, I'm gonna post it one more time. That's your IP right there. You can treat that exactly the same. If you can't get the Docker app up and running, you can go to that IP address as well. Let's check in with Dennis here. Dennis, Dennis, my guy. Echo Deb Arch MD64. Yeah. Permission denied. Are you running? Let's see here. You've got to run the install scripts as sudo. If you're going into Etsy app sources and you're getting permission denied, you're probably not at the root level executing for that command. Nice, we got success for the IP, looking good. I guess I should caveat that a lot of uh, web app hacking, a lot of really red teaming, uh, internal stuff, external stuff in general, is a lot of this, it's troubleshooting, it's getting errors, it's it's Googling the error message. So um, so it's a, it's a good skill to have to uh, try to work through this stuff. Uh, and if you, if you do this for a career, you're gonna be doing this a lot. Google is your absolute best friend. Tom Marsland from VetSec. I think I know that, guys. Does Matt, this is extremely well put together. Thank you, sir. Uh, you're the one who allowed me to put this together. So I appreciate it. And and Jen and Ben and everybody at HackerOne, you guys allowed me to, uh, to put this on. So I appreciate it. Now, I have a question for chat. Has anybody found what they think is the, the total amount of flags? It's been, it hasn't been quite too long yet, but... Has anybody found what they think is the total amount of flags at this point? And if you guys want to cash in on some some tokens to get some hints, I can. I suppose I can do that as well. <laughs> Thirteen, a little high, I would say, a little high. LOL, no, that's okay. Keep at it, my guy. Keep at it. Five, five, getting there. Not, not the total, but you are getting there. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm going to help you guys out. All right. SQL injection is one of my favorites. So I guess this is the one that I'll do for the on-screen walkthrough. You've already seen me do a little bit of the SQL map stuff. Let's see if we can get the manual injection to kick off. Remember um, in the guide, it details that there are some hints down here. So if you're having some trouble, just you know, pop one of those hints up. And it says SQL injection is achieved by escaping the query that is being used to gather uh, the information from the backend database. Where or what can you insert into the username field of this to close off the query? So for manual SQL injection, remember that the web application is going to act on behalf of the uh, user. And the user is going to say, hey, I would like to log in. My password, my username is Matt and my password is Matt. And the web application via PHP or um, JavaScript or some, some kind of other language is going to say, okay, we've got Matt and we've got Matt, the username and password. I'm going to take these and I'm going to plug these right into a SQL query that's going to the backend database. And it's going to say, hey, excuse me, backend database, is there anybody here that has a username of Matt and a password of Matt? And if so, if that returns more any equal to or more than one row in this case, in this specific case, uh, this user is good please log them in. So your query looks like select uh, ID name from user or whatever the table is named, where username equals single quote, Matt, single quote, like that, 
and password equals single quote Matt. In fact, let's grab this. Let's bring this over to mouse pad and I'll make it a little uh, mouse pad. A little easier to see here. All right, so when we do SQL injection, that's our query, right? So usually in the web form, these are variables. And it says, all right, we are just waiting for two inputs here. And we're going to select as a typo. Thank you, sir. Select. Select. So it usually has two variables here in the mat for username and mat for password. It's going to take those values and it's going to plug them right into this query. So here's the problem. In this particular example, whatever is going into this username field is not uh, sanitized. And what I mean by that is it's treating whatever input you put into this field as exactly that. It's just an input. It's not plain text. It's, uh, it's not specified as any kind of, of what you should do with this. Um, it's just text. And the problem is that when you put just text into a database, it's going to take that query and make a database query for whatever that it ends up with, right? And so what you can do, select ID, common name from user, where username equals Matt, a single quotation mark will escape and close off this query right here. So that's the first part. And this is, again, this is in a, a very uh, preliminary kind of like bare bones SQL injection. You're going to inject or a condition that we know to be true to evaluate, to be evaluated by the SQL database to say, hey, this is absolutely true if it's evaluated by a backend. One equals one. What's more true than that? One equals one. And then we're going to enter two dashes, a space, and then one more dash. Effectively, what is accomplished here is that the rest of this query goes bye bye. And this says, hey, database, can you please select the ID and the name? from the table where the username equals Matt, full stop. Hey, database, if you can't find anything there, or tell me if one equals one and evaluate that statement. Does one equal one? That's effectively what you're telling the database. You're tricking it into doing something that it was not intended to do. And so if you take this into practice, we'll do the admin user. Single quotation mark, remember, we are closing off the query here. So our single quotation mark is going right there. Or one equals one, a, a, um, a piece of information that we know the database will evaluate as true. Space, dash, dash, space, dash. Put our comments in there. And again, we have to input both uh, fields. So you can put random input in here. I just ASD, ASD. And again, if the demo gods are kind, we should. I think I'm still in intercept, so I should turn that off. Yep, there we go. If the data gods are kind, uh, I think I will try that again. Admin or one equals one. Log in. And there it is. So in real world scenario, you're effectively telling the database, hey, when this person wants to log in, either log them in with that username or evaluate if one equals one and one absolutely equals one, and there you go. You're logged in. And there's your flag. Whoops. There it is right there. And that's one flag. And so that's your, your walkthrough on SQL injection right there. That is one of the four uh, vulnerabilities that's available in this lab. And there may be an additional flag for SQL injection if you use the automated method. So we can go back to SQL I. Remember that there is a manual, which is I just uh, detailed for you guys right there. There's also the SQL map reveal answer right here. If you're stuck on this one, use SQL map to reveal answer. You'll get the, um, it's actually like a three step process for SQL map, but you can blow the back doors all, like wide open on the, uh, on the back end database if you use SQL map and grab all of the information that's in there. So. All right, we've got eight minutes by the looks of it. Does anybody have any questions? Anything at all? I think I got to just about everything.
How are we doing in chat? Let's see. The spread of flags is five to 13 at this point. Yep. Nine is five plus four and 13 minus four. Try injecting that into the SQL injection parameters and see if it works. <laughs> there is also a, um, uh, of in the, in the SQL injection video, I go over how to do a blind sleep test. Um, super, super useful. If you come across, if you are web, uh, pen testing a website and you suspect that there might be a backend database connection that you can inject into, but the web application is smart enough or the person that coded the web application is smart enough to not show you errors. Um, error based SQL injection can be a very easy way to get an injectable, um, to get injection into the database. So if the person coding that is smart enough to not let you get the errors when you inject into it, a blind SQL injection is when you are trying to prove the existence of an injection point without any errors. And the sleep test can be a very easy and, and um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A very simple, easy, and uh, effective way to do that. So go check out that video in the student walkthrough about how to do a sleep test. Very good for blind SQL injection. Okay, uh, Matt, I'm not sure if you want me to hold on for the next few minutes. Uh, we can, so you can keep uh, answering questions or we can move on to the next uh, speaker. Yeah, um, if uh, we can move on, absolutely. Kind of keep us on track. I can I can stay and answer questions for the last five minutes and then I can, uh, or well, you I got guess- five yeah. minutes either way, it's up we, to you. Yeah, sure. I, I can answer <laughs> okay. questions in the, um, yeah, Brian's in at six. I can answer questions for the next couple of minutes. Um, okay. And then we can uh, cut right over to the next speaker. Any questions at all, guys? Any Anything at all? Again, if you're still having trouble getting the Docker application set up and you still want to do that, please DM me directly um, or use the, the IP address that we posted. I'll post that one more time. Let me grab that. And I'll throw that in the Discord chat as well. get chat up here. Great exercise, Matt. Thank you so much for playing, Michael. Um, and uh, to everybody else, um, thank you so much for uh, attending. I hope it's it's working out for you guys. I hope you can walk away from this. Move at your own pace, um, learn at your own pace, and I hope you can walk away having learned something. Um, I'll practice again tonight. Awesome. Super fun stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I will say, um, it looks like nobody's gotten the correct number of flags at this point. I will give you the hint, and this hint is on the last page of the O course as well. Um, there are nine flags total. And so if you think there are four vulnerabilities and, and one additional one for the automatic SQL injection, that'll get you five. But there are four other ones that are Easter eggs um, that you might not have uh, gone found when you know if you're just using the web application as its intended course. Um, so think like a hacker, try to find maybe some of the alternate routes there, use the tools, uh, you know, combined using tools to try to find some of these other ones, um, and go find nine flags. And if you can find nine flags, DM me, uh, in discord and I will verify if they are correct. And the first 10 people to do that, will get their name immortalized on the GitHub page along with their handle and a note if, if you so desire, as long as it's appropriate, but all right, we've only got a couple minutes left. I think I'm gonna sign off um, real quick before I go. A huge thank you uh, to Jen and Ben and Hacker One for putting this on. A huge thank you to everybody in the audience today. Please stay safe, guys. Um, please, I wish the best for you. I wish the best for your families uh, in these, these unprecedented times. Um, and thank you to Tom um, from VetSec for putting me up to this. Uh, this. This is an absolute blast. I had a bunch of fun putting this lab together. Um, and uh, yeah, and thanks to our our uh, our MC uh, Roro today and uh, Wilson for the um, the talk earlier, 
And so my name is Matt Husky Hacks. I guess I'll just do my little, little sign off here. Big thanks to Emily, my partner, Jen Ben Hacker One. I already said all that stuff, all of you participating. And that's my LinkedIn. And uh, I don't Twitter, um, but you can find me at huskyhacks.dev. Uh, and I am open to tutoring. Just email me huskyhacks.mk at gmail. Um, I do this stuff for free. I just, I, I teach because I like teaching. So, and that's me. Thank you so much. Take care of yourself. I'll see you guys later. That was absolutely great. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, I wish I had had this kind of tutoring and mentorship when I was first starting out myself. It was just struggling through um, backtrack back then and trying to find my way through it. <laughs> so this was like even helpful for me. It was great. Um, all right. So with that, I wanted to introduce our, our next speaker. Um, I think he's live in chat here, but we also have a video. So we're just going to roll that in the next minute. Um, so Adam Sheffield. Um, is joining us from the Undercroft. He believes in challenging the status quo and brings this mindset to his role as the founder and CEO of the Undercroft. Um, so the Undercroft is a member-driven cybersecurity guild and development center located in historic um, Weiber <laughs> City, Florida. Uh, they offer secure uh, workspaces, uh, tailored in, uh, resources and focused programming uh, for individuals and organizations that seek to grow and advance in cybersecurity tools, um, secure innovation and national security as well. So he's currently the co-chair of the USF uh, Cybersecurity Education Advisory Board and serves as the vice president of the Tampa chapter of the Military Cybersecurity Professional Association. Um, he's also a founding member and current president of the Cybor, a uh, not-for-profit information security guild uh, housed in the Intercroft um, in Wybor City, Florida. And so with that, I think we're going to kick off a about a 47 minute video on the journey through InfoSec and uh, starting the Undercroft. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope everybody's enjoyed the speakers up to this point in this uh, wonderful event that's being put on by HackerOne, um, specifically with Veterans Day, literally right around the corner tomorrow. Um, these conversations are very necessary uh, for us veterans looking to find meaning and purpose in life post-service. And uh, I want to thank HackerOne very much for inviting me to speak about my experience and how my journey has led to the establishment of the Undercroft, um, a cybersecurity guild and development center headquartered here in Tampa, Florida. I don't often talk about myself, um, and I found this uh, recording or, or actually uh, giving this talk to be somewhat difficult. In fact, I'm probably on about my eighth take right now of trying to work through, you know, really what I was asked to cover by HackerOne during this talk. Um, but I must thank the team over at HackerOne for lighting this fire under my rear end to begin speaking about my own experience in hopes uh, that it can help other veterans find a path to our industry. I thought long and hard. I, I started out with a slide deck. I made it a little bit more formal, and, and this just so happens to coincide with, uh, you know, some issues that I've been going through personally, like a lot of us in the veteran community have, um, as it relates to things such as PTSD, mental health issues, um, and, and that's only been compounded by what we've all experienced, even non-veterans going through one of the craziest years on record, 2020, uh, starting with the uh, the pandemic, um, obviously culminating in quite a contentious election here in the U.S. Um, once again, I think this, the timing of this event is great. Um, I'm really happy to be able to participate. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, by, by giving a little bit about myself, um, I'll be able to help other veterans uh, in our, our tribe, so to speak, find their path in this industry. For the next 45 minutes or so, I'm, I'm kind of going to give a play-by-play -play of my life from childhood to uh, military service to cybersecurity, because it really was a very abstract path. Um, there was no A to B for me. In fact, there was many road bumps and, and disruptions uh, and obstacles during my, uh, my attempts, not only to secure a, a career post-military when, frankly, when I joined, I thought I was going to be a lifer, um, you know, all the way to making it into the industry that I'm in now, um, cybersecurity, and having a lot of great successes along the way, um, as well as my fair, fair share of failures which um, you know really helped me learn that you know failing's part of life, and uh, and really emphasize that the best thing to do when you fail is to learn from that, so you can be better um, the next time around. Um, kind of what I'll be talking about, like I mentioned, over the next forty-five minutes, um, really is personal to me. Uh, I hope it resonates uh, with you folks that are tuning in here. 
Um, and I'd like to kind of last comment before I jump in. If anybody would ever like to reach out to me, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'll ensure that uh, the HackerOne staff provides my email address um, as part of the, uh, the wrap up for the event. But I'm always open and appreciate feedback from other veterans. I'm still honing my public speaking skills. And, and more importantly, with, with what's going on in the world right now, I'm always willing to support other veterans in the community in any way I can, um, whether that be with you know, personal issues they may be going through or folks that really want to, to make that transition into security as a career field. Um, I'm always, always happy to open my door, open my, my ears, so to speak, um, if it has to be done over a Zoom call. But, but I'm here to help. And the organization we built down here in Tampa, the Undercroft, was really built around the foundational principles that we all as veterans hold dear, um, primarily in trying to make a community of practice that can help not only veterans, but others that are trying to make an impact in the cybersecurity field have a group that they can rely on over the course of a career for mentorship, guidance, motivation, um, things along those lines. So without any much, uh, any much more pop and circumstance, I'll kind of hop right into you know, how I got started, um, really all the way from childhood, all the way up to uh, my initial years in the military, to separation, to defense contracting, to my pursuits in academia, and then finally to where I'm at today. So to really start things off, let me go ahead and grab a, a sip of coffee here, keep myself awake. Um, I was born and raised in Ohio, um, born and raised uh, in a, a small town in Northwest Ohio, uh, born to a single mother, um, never met my biological father. Um, it was an interesting time. I did not have a male father figure in my life until I was adopted by my stepfather um, when I was seven years old. And my mother worked her, her butt off day in and day out to provide for me as an only child um, and make sure I had the best, the best opportunities at my disposal to the extent that she was able to, um, to provide. And I think a lot of that really kind of shaped my, my early experiences in life and really was kind of the motivation that made me want to ensure that, you know, when I got ready to have children or start a family that I was able to, you know, improve on what my mother had instilled in, in me at such a young age. Um, and really be able to, you know, pay back or give back to folks in the community that helped my mother and, my, and myself when I was younger, um, trying to navigate, you know, the early years of my life. So, you know, grew up in Northwest Ohio um, in a very Catholic family. So I actually grew up, uh, I went to an elementary school that was a, a Catholic school. So wearing uniforms uh, all the way from kindergarten through graduating eighth grade. While I was in elementary school, uh, in, in my first grade year, I was actually diagnosed with ADHD. Um, I know a lot of us in the cybersecurity community are familiar with that. I'm sure a lot of folks of my generation have probably had that same diagnosis. Um, it was interesting. So, you know, I struggled early on in school. I was not the best student. I was probably a straight C student. Um, it wasn't until I met... Uh, it was actually one of my first grade teachers that realized I had a real knack for reading and analysis. And one of the nice things, or one of the, one of the things that I would say I was blessed with was having some teachers that recognized some of the things that I was good at and would actually let me, you know, take a step back from the formal curriculum that was offered in the elementary schools at that time and, and go off uh, in the corner of the room with a little potted plant on my desk and, and read books. I remember reading uh, the book Sphere um, from front, front to cover in about a week, week and a half um, when I was in, uh, in first grade. And that's really how I started to learn to deal with um, uh, an ADHD diagnosis that really helped me be able to focus, um, focus my uh, efforts um, in productive areas um, and, and helped me kind of become a better student in the process. Um, you know, kind of remained a medi mediocre student throughout middle school, elementary school. I really didn't hit my stride until high school. And I started high school to kind of date myself uh, in 2000. So this was the year before 9-11, uh, which I know was a, a major, uh, major event in a lot of veterans my age uh, in their history. And in a lot of us, it's one of the reasons we decided to sign on the dotted line and serve our country. So when I hit high school, you know, the first year I did okay. It was in that, that sophomore year after 9-11 happened and, and after, you know, I'd been adopted by my father in middle school who was a retired intel officer that I knew that I wanted to, uh, to be in the service. So I really started having a goal early on in high school um, of serving in the U.S. military. So I worked my butt off um, uh, for my studies. I, I ran track. I ran cross country. Really started laying the foundations to, to be able to excel in a... Uh, 
in a military career, and my goal as of my sophomore year was to go to West Point. Um, and that really was that kind of spirit of service that, that drove me in my, uh, in my early years. So fast forward to my, my, my senior year in high school, you know, I went through, you know, everything. I applied for scholarships. I actually went through the formal West Point application process. And I was lucky enough to actually get the congressional nomination um, to be able to um, start at West Point uh, after I graduated high school. The only thing standing in my way at that point was the uh, Dodd-Merb for, uh, physical. For any of you that are familiar with that, much like the standard physical we would go through as an enlisted person. This also happened to be before um, anybody had told me that you always lie to the recruiter. <laughs> so I show up for my, uh, my Dodd-Merb physical and, you know, everything seems to be going just fine. I get close to the end of the appointment and the, uh, the question comes up about uh, medication. Have you ever been diagnosed with uh, any conditions and uh, had to take a medication for that? Um, in your youth. And me being naive, uh, you know, brought up the fact that I was diagnosed with ADHD in first grade, and I was uh, on uh, medication for most of my uh, academic career at that point um, to be able to help with focus and help myself, uh, uh, you know, be able to achieve the grades that I actually needed to achieve to be able to achieve my goal of going to West Point um, and serving as an officer in the United States Army. Um, Left the Dodd Merb physical thinking uh, everything went perfectly well and, and that was the last step and uh, everything would be good to go from there. About two weeks later, I got the letter in the mail that said, you are unfit for military service, primarily because of the uh, ADHD diagnosis um, and the fact that I had been on medication um, primarily in my middle school years, um, even though I had tapered off that medication in high school. So. I did what any uh, young, uh, motivated, maybe not so wise uh, uh, individual would do at 18 years of age, and I went to the first recruiter I could find and signed on the dotted line to enlist in the U.S. Army um, with a chosen MOS of infantry. Primarily because I grew up outdoors in Northwest Ohio, I had shot for the state rifle team. You know, my generation was was I don't want to say lucky enough, but you know, with 9/11 and the subsequent invasion of Iraq, you know. That was the first live televised invasion of a foreign country in American history. So I remember, you know, in my sophomore, junior, and senior years, uh, as the uh, the war in Iraq was kicking off, you know, I'd stay up till 2 a.m., 3 a.m., being able to see in real time um, what was happening uh, overseas, which also led me to pick uh, pick that MOS as my uh, desired career field. So, you know, I. I graduated from high school 2004, shipped off to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, a lovely sand hill, um, to knock out my one station unit training for uh, infantry um, in hopes of, you know, pinning on my, uh, uh, my blue cord and my crossed rifles uh, at the end, uh, which I, I did do. At that particular point, uh, you know, kind of did the, uh, the normal uh, military thing. Uh, my first deployment came up in 2006-2007 uh, um, when I deployed to Iraq. Um, to Nineveh province, um, actually Telafer, for those that uh, um, are, are familiar with, uh, with the area over there. And uh, it was at that point, you know, I was not married, had no kids, didn't have a house, had nothing holding me back. It was a rough deployment. Um, we were actually present for uh, one of the, well, actually about two to three blocks away from the largest VBIED um, to be detonated since the beginning of the Iraq war. Um, happened on March 26th in a, uh, a primarily Shia district um, in northwestern Telafer. And after that happened, I, I kind of knew, you know, my life is, is dedicated and devoted to service at this point. And, and it was my goal, you know, coming back from that deployment um, when my time was up, um, after I spent about another year and a half um, in a training role, training other folks that were getting ready to deploy to Iraq and Afghanistan, that I wanted to go, uh, go get my bachelor's degree in order to uh, become an officer in the U.S. Army. So I left active duty in late, uh, I believe it was late 2000, uh, 2008, moved down here to Tampa, Florida um, to finish up my bachelor's degree, which I started working on in uniform, um, but uh, was trying to finish up the last two to three years of my degree here in Tampa. During that time, um, as things often do, you know, life happened. Um, I met my current wife, uh, we had our first child, and I kind of saw, well, maybe my goal and my, my plans weren't necessarily going to work out. Um, with a, a, a new wife at home, with a new child on the way, still trying to finish my bachelor's degree, I slowly started to watch that, that, kind, of, that kind of dream of a full career be left in the dust. Primarily because I wanted to be there to see my child grow up. I wanted to be there for my wife. So I ended up... Uh, 
Uh, at that point, uh, going and transitioning into the National Guard for stabilization, um, maintain my, uh, uh, my uh, affiliation with the National Guard for two years of stabilization while I finished my bachelor's degree. And, you know, really kind of jumped into what we all, those of us that have done it before understand, and those of us that haven't will soon navigate, which is that, that separation process. And, and the separation process for me wasn't just, you know, getting my DD-214 and walking out the door. It really was for that last or that first year to two years um, when I was finishing up my bachelor's degree with a young family, um, you know, still, you know, doing my one weekend a month for stabilization with the National Guard, I, you know, I was kind of hit in the face, like, what do I do now? <laughs> my entire kind of viewpoint on life had been shaken at the very foundation. I lost my support network, uh, my brothers and sisters in uniform, and I found myself really searching for meaning and purpose. Um, where am I going to find that, uh, that level of meaning that I had in uniform? So, uh, went through that, you know, like a lot of veterans, you know, I had my share, fair share of, uh, um, issues, uh, during that transition period. One of those being, uh, uh, substance abuse to a certain extent, um, relying a little bit too much on our friend, uh, the bottle, um, when things got a, uh, a little hectic with life. Um, but you know, over that two year period, finishing up that bachelor's degree and, and landing my first civilian role, you know, I thought I had a pretty lucky, um, having, you know, other, uh, um, other friends that were either still in uniform or were in the process of, of separation, I felt like I got, to, you know, I got the good end of the stick. You know, I was happily married, um, had a new child on the way, finishing up my bachelor's degree, getting ready to uh, to jump into the workforce. Unfortunately, it was a, uh, a great depression going on at that time, or should I say recession? But you know, I, I really thought I was lucky, um, finishing my degree um, and getting ready to start a new chapter in my life. So, you know, finished up my bachelor's degree in 2010, um, was lucky enough to actually have a job offer uh, before I finished my last semester, um, working for a technology company here in Tampa, where I had the opportunity to kind of keep one foot in the military side of the house, um, although not in uniform, um, but also be kind of operating as a, a, uh, a member of the, uh, um, the corporate workforce. So for the first year of my post-military career, my responsibilities were excuse me, um, helping to identify um, individuals to support government contracts um, here at U.S. Special Operations and U.S. Central Command um, here in Tampa, Florida. So this was really this first year, me being a motivated uh, prior service member jumping in, I wanted to learn everything I could about defense contracting, not just what my task at hand was, which was for lack of a better word, putting butts in seats with the appropriate clearance and skill set uh, to perform against the requirements that both of these commands had um, here in Tampa Bay. So did that for about a year. And, and after a year, you know, working for this large technology company, I just, I had this feeling that, you know, this wasn't where I wanted to be. Um, you know, I was, yes, I still had kind of that tie to the DOD community, but I was not surrounded by any other veterans. I didn't have any other colleagues within that uh, particular company that really had a background similar to mine. Um, and it was at this point, you know, I had come off uh, my uh, uh, stabilization with the National Guard. And, and a week after that, a week after I left uh, the National Guard, I just, I had a breakdown. I was like, I, I can't imagine, even if it's not, you know, part-time or full-time, I can't imagine not being in uniform. So I immediately ran out the door um, to uh, another recruiter, in this particular case, a reserve recruiter, and said, hey, you know, I just separated from the, um, um, from active duty, from the National Guard on stabilization. My MOS is 11 Bravo. I really want to get back in uniform, you know, even though it'd just be one, one week out a month, two weeks a year, you know, what, what's available for me? So they went through, you know, looked at my ASFAB scores, my NCOERs, my performance. And uh, I remember getting the call from the recruiter saying, you know, Adam, your, your background, you know, with the scores you've had, you know, the foreign language capability you already have, you'd be a great candidate for the intelligence community or the intelligence field. Um, and at that point, they just so happened to be standing up uh, what are called Army Reserve elements that were um, uh, traditional reservists that were supporting active duty mission sets um, aligned with the various COCOMs. Um, including CENTCOM being one of them. So I said, you know, this would be awesome, an opportunity to continue to serve my country uh, in uniform um, in a way to kind of get that foot back into the door um, that, I, uh, that I missed, you know, even in just that one week of not uh, being associated with the Guard. Um, but I was excited. Now came the, uh, the one year of waiting for my security clearance to come through so I could actually go to the schoolhouse and reclass as a human intelligence collector. Um, 
so went through that process, ended up leaving uh, for about six months um, after I, I quit my, my first job uh, to leave for um, the schoolhouse to go ahead and, and get my uh, 35 mic uh, qualification to be a human intelligence collector. Um, once I finished that up, I, I came back down here to Tampa, you know, with a newly minted security clearance and intelligence training and, uh, you know, ready to look at, you know, how can I put this to use in my civilian career in a way that's a little bit more, you know, once again, fulfilling and meaningful to me personally, where I actually could at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the year, be able to sit back and say, Hey, I'm still making an impact in a, in an area that I feel very passionate about. So Interestingly enough, at that point, this was the first startup I had the opportunity to work with was a DC-based um, uh, defense contracting startup called Concepts and Strategies. And this is really how I kind of made that transition into what people nowadays refer to as cybersecurity. So um, I realized from my previous experience working for that larger technology company that you know big corporate America wasn't for me. I did not like the structure. I did not like the fact that you know, I'd sit there with an SOP handed to me saying, hey, you have to do things like this. We don't care about your input, about any other aspect of the organization. We want you to show up every day, do your job and go home. And to me, that just it stifled my creativity. It stifled everything that I had learned in the military, specifically as an infantryman, where, you know, we push decision making authority and delegate that down to the lowest level possible. So I kind of found in working with uh, concepts and strategies, my first true startup experience, I found you know, where I wanted to be. I, I wanted to be able to be part of building something from the ground up, building something from scratch, um, being able to kind of chart the future for myself within an organization. Because if you've ever worked for a startup before, you, you understand that you know, a job description is just that, a job description. In a startup, you're often wearing many different hats. You could be asked to do something that you have no familiarity with at any given moment. And I always liked that challenge and the ability to really kind of think creatively, think critically, and solve solve problems. So ended up with this organization doing some really interesting work. We had started a, um, a pilot program, and this probably would have been in about the 2013 time frame. So right about when the Arab Spring was popping off um, overseas, specifically in the CENTCOM area of responsibility. And this pilot program, you know, was kind of the precursor to a lot of things that are now associated with the cybersecurity field. So I supported a lot of uh, what are called military information support operations and information operations programs where we were really looking at um, really as the Arab Spring was unfolding, um, how we could build teams of digital natives with language capabilities to really identify um, online through regional blogs, through social media, kind of keep our finger on the pulse of what was happening during the Arab Spring. Um, and how extremist ideologies were, were penetrating the information environment or shifting perceptions in that sphere. I absolutely loved what I did. Um, I, I had the opportunity to build a team of very bright um, uh, young analysts um, with native language proficiencies, many of them former service members um, that had served in uniform before getting into contracting. And really this role allowed me to build my network um, to, to find these people that could support these types of projects. I found myself you know, traveling, you know, monthly to various universities across the country, whether it be uh, Georgetown in Washington, D.C., University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, academic institutions that were known for having very good language programs or regional and cultural study programs, um, and, and convincing these individuals to take a chance on leaving these, these cultural hubs, such as a Washington, D.C., to move down here to uh, what many people would view as, you know, redneck Tampa, Florida, um, to support some of these projects we were working on for U.S. Uh, US Central Command. So I did that for about two and a half years. Um, and this was, you know, the 2013-20, or excuse me, this was the 2011-12 uh, uh, and 13 time frame. And then come 2013, this was really when the first round or first uh, notion of sequester came across uh, uh, my desk, which for those of you that have lived through it on the defense contracting side, you know, really sucked when we were having to deal with continuing resolutions, funding getting held up um, due to political infighting and squabbling, and I'd have to go tell my employees out on site, hey, you know, the customer still wants you to go to work, but they're not going to be able to pay us, so we can't pay you. Um, I really did not like that, considering we were doing some amazing work, had some amazing people. And it was at that point that I realized, you know, as much as I like defense contracting, it, it didn't provide the stability um, that I was looking for long term. And what I mean by that is the ability to maintain continuity of operations for our customers. 
And also what I noticed was a lack of the ability for us to deliver innovative solutions to our clients or our customers, primarily because at that time, you know, we were competing on price um, and it really was, here's what I need as a customer. You as a contractor or a provider, I want you to tell me how you're going to provide what I want. Not necessarily, this is the concept. How would you go about implementing this or, or, or uh, solving some of these problems for us? And then really to kind of, you know, hammer the point home during sequester when we were up for rebidding some of our contracts as a lot of the work was starting to dry up from the big surge in the early 2000s we saw a lot of the larger um, defense contractors coming in and going after the work that normally we as a small business you know had the opportunity to make a larger impact in so it was at that point that i, I started kind of putting my feelers out there you know what's next um, what's next in my career what's next in my life and and it just so happened with all of my travels to various universities to find talent to support um, our programs, I had, I had built a really good network of uh, professors within ac academia, um, specifically here at USF, um, a, a, very, uh, a very astute professor named Dr. Mosin Milani, who runs the Center for Strategic and Diplomatic Studies out at USF. And uh, you know, I'd had lunch with him, mentioned I'm kind of looking for my next challenge, I was a little bit fed up with the defense contracting community, and, and he said, hey, Adam, you know, out here at USF, they've got this, and bear in mind, this was uh, early 2013, um, they've got some initiatives in place. They, they want to create a state center to support cybersecurity. And I was like, oh, that's, that's really interesting. Um, you know, kind of aligns with what I was doing on the IO side, and he mentioned they were looking for somebody that had relationships within the DOD. Um, that had a, a, uh, an interest in veteran transition. So how can we take folks that are separating from the service and, uh, and plus up or thicken the pipeline of talent available to uh, stakeholders here in the state of Florida? And, and I immediately jumped on. I said, you know, this sounds like a great initiative. How can I help? And uh, in late 2013, I actually got uh, a job offer to uh, go join USF uh, as an administrator. Um, working with the then director, um, Sri, in putting together the plan and proposal to um, stand up in 2014 a state center that would focus on three primary initiatives. Um, education, um, how do we increase throughput of folks with the skill set necessary to make an impact in cybersecurity? Research, how do we, how do we facilitate and, uh, and catalyze outside the box thinking and research that can lead to new solutions um, to solve existing challenges in the cybersecurity domain. And really from a, a state standpoint, you know, how that research engine could lead to new startups um, here in the Tampa Bay area that could ultimately grow high wage, um, uh, high impact careers for folks coming out of workforce development programs statewide. And then finally, the, the last thing we focused on was outreach. So how do we educate the general public um, here in the state of Florida on the threat that security pose or poses. And, you know, met, remember this is 2013, 2014, um, before the year 2020 came around, before, you know, everybody's grandmother and grandfather are getting your, uh, your Nigerian prince calls. So it really was a great concept and a great idea. And I was really excited about the opportunity to go to academia where, you know, from the outside looking in, seemed like that place that I'd always been looking for where I could put my my creativity to work where I could help others. And really, you know, I looked at it as, you know, it's not always just gonna be the bottom line that drives decision-making. This is a place where we can take risk. This is a place where we can try new things. So I kind of jumped in head first in 2013, 2014, um, helped write the plan and, and push it through the legislative process to get the Florida Center for Cybersecurity established in state statute in uh, 20, uh, 2014. And from there, my role really kind of shifted um, to being the associate director of the center, focusing on um, non-traditional workforce development. Um, so how can we look outside the bounds of a traditional undergraduate or graduate degree program to accelerate talent to the market? And then also focusing on uh, military partnerships. So how can we work with um, the military institutions uh, and, and service components, whether it be COCOMs like Central Command, U.S. Special Operations Command, the modeling and simulations hub out in Orlando, um, all the way down to U.S. Southern Command down uh, in the Miami area. My goal is to develop these partnerships, or, or my task was to develop these partnerships and focus on how we can um, how we can really support not only the uh, the military's uh, efforts in our state 
and keep them in our state, um, but also help veterans that are transitioning, that, that are moving to Florida, with us being a very veteran-friendly state, to get the base level skills um, that they need to secure a career um, in the cybersecurity industry. So two of my, my, my early wins, two of the things that I'm most proud of uh, being able to accomplish while I was at USF um, supporting the Florida Center for Cybersecurity was first and foremost, um, the New Skills for a New Fight program. So within the first year of the center being funded, um, the president of the university and the provost pulled me aside and said, Adam, you know, what the legislature wants to see is they want to see us come up with a concept um, to take service members that are transitioning off active duty or unemployed and underemployed service members or veterans and be able to provide them with a rapid path uh, to secure employment, entry-level employment in the security field. So spent a, a year prior um, to doing this, first and foremost, looking at how can we get funding we need to be able to get a program like this off the ground. And we developed a concept of how we wanted this program to look. And really what uh, we landed on was we wanted a program that you know, kind of using myself as a, as a guinea pig here, I looked at upon my separation from active duty, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't the type of person that wanted to go sit um, in a classroom for four years and, and just kind of, for lack of a better word, malinger for four years until I got my degree, you know, you know utilizing BAH to, to stay alive, all that other good stuff. I just wanted to get to work. I wanted to start being able to provide for my family. I was perfectly happy being able to, uh, you know, go part-time to finish my degree if I needed. So we really took the opportunity to reach out to folks that are veterans that are already in the security field and folks that were considering going into the security field to say, you know, how could we structure a program that would allow you to go from zero to hero, um, so to speak, for an entry level role really focused on uh, entry level analyst positions here in the local area, primarily because it's a great opportunity we could train a veteran to be an analyst in less than a year. Um, with our network of employers that were beating down our door saying we can't find talent, um, we knew we could get them into these entry-level roles, which, you know, looking at my transition, my first full-time job out of the military was making $30,000 a year, um, which was a big pay cut from, uh, you know, when I was an E5 on active duty. And uh, a lot of jobs we saw here, entry-level roles in security, were paying anywhere from forty dollars to $75,000 starting. So we built a program called New Skills for a New Fight uh, around this concept. It was a three-phased program that consisted of a um, academic underpinning um, in the first um, semester, I'll, I'll call it the spring portion of the program, which was really to lay the theoretical foundations of what any good analyst should know. Basic uh, computer science, um, basic uh, programming skills, basic information security. Um, and really the goal was to provide that foundation that would then lead into an intensive course of study or period of instruction taking place during a summer semester um, here in Tampa where we actually replicated a security operations center um, on uh, campus at USF where our students, um, of which we had 20 um, that were sponsored by a grant from J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation, went through a, a formal period of instruction on how to be an effective analyst, focusing primarily on practical skills, um, applying what they learned in that spring uh, session that was theoretical, leading into what would become the third phase of the program in the fall was uh, the equivalent of on-the-job training. So we worked with our employer partners in the region to be able to take these folks out of their summer um, intensive program of instruction and drop them into a security operations center as an employee being able to make money um, provide for their families, get a jump start on building the experience they need to progress in the field, um, while also being able to finish their bachelor's degree part time, either in the evening or online, or online while they were actually working and providing for their family. So, was very proud and very happy with that program. And from there, you know, the other program that I was able to stand up was um, actually uh, myself and uh, some representatives from eight other university, very uh, veteran friendly universities here in the U.S were able to uh, make a collective push to secure a federal um, appropriation to stand up a program called the NSA P3 program, which provided uh, full scholarships to uh, separating service members that were interested in moving into security uh, career field. So this scholarship would provide, without them having to touch their VA benefits, 100% tuition, a uh, living stipend, a uh, stipend to purchase a new computer if theirs was not uh, appropriate for the course of study they chose, as well as funding to attend a security conference once a year while they were navigating um, the course of their program. So um, 
launched that program, kind of coinciding with the new skills for a new fight program. Really what, what my time at the University of South Florida, the, the three years that I spent there allowed me to do was really find refuge in helping other veterans because I didn't realize it, but during that time I was struggling myself, still not getting fully over that, um, that transition. And by being surrounded by other veterans um, that were all, all of us kind of shared that collective mindset and collective you know, notion of selfless service, being able to help them find a way to continue that post-military was very fulfilling to me. Um, with that said, I also found being in academia that it was very, very difficult, you know, kind of going there thinking this is a place where you can take risks and launch new programs. It really wasn't everything I expected, primarily because, you know, USF is a public institution and things move slow in academia. So come, uh, you know, late 2016, you know, had, had done my part in helping get the center going. You know, we had a great team out there. Um, we're really working uh, great partnerships and great programs across the state university system. I went to, to my supervisor and said, Sri, I'm, I'm ready for my next challenge. I'm here to help you guys any way I can, but I really want to focus 100% on how we can develop non-traditional pipelines of talent, not only for veterans, but for folks, whether they're displaced or underemployed or unemployed, how can we get them if they have the right mindset and the passion for this career field, they're not just in it for the money. How do we get them the uh, the tools they need to make that that transition and gain those skills effectively? So, in late 2016, I put my notice in at the uh, um, University of South Florida and left to join a, a seed stage startup called SecureSet Academy out of Denver, Colorado. I had met the founders of SecureSet through a mutual friend of mine uh, that had happened to be at the Pentagon um, while we were working on the NSA P3 program. And he knew I was getting a little bit, um, I wouldn't say upset, but I was getting a little bit burnt out in the academic uh, field. And he said, hey, Adam, I'm going to introduce you to Brett. I think you guys have a lot of uh, common ideas around education and security. Um, and I know Brett's really looking at, um, you know, ex extending what they've done in Denver to other cities. So uh, in 2017, I was charged with um, standing up the first campus of SecureSet Academy outside of Colorado um, here in Tampa, Florida. So spent uh, pretty much all of 2017 going through the process to get uh, programs accredited by the Commission for Independent Education, uh, se selecting a location for us to offer training um, where we actually landed on historic Ybor City, Florida um, as a place for our Tampa campus uh, due to the proximity to SoftWorks, which was a, uh, a SOCOM initiative um, uh, focused on rapid prototyping um, and accelerating solutions to the warfighter. So spent that 2017 timeframe getting the operations stood up and recruiting our first cohort of students to go through our accelerated uh, boot camp called CORE that officially launched in uh, early 2018. We got Secure set up and running. Uh, once again, me being me, you know, I was like, yeah, we've, we've, we've put another notch in our belt from, uh, you know, how we can support, you know, a more robust workforce, but there were still, still challenges and problems out there I saw. And me being me, I was like, you know, I'm ready for my next challenge. So I passed the baton to a, a new director um, to run the uh, um, the campus out there at Ebor uh, in Ebor City, and it was at that point where we really kind of got to where I'm at today, um, which is the founding of the Undercroft, and the Undercroft itself started with a a white paper that myself and a few other members of the uh, the security community here in Tampa had written um, when I was in the process of standing up the Florida Center for Cybersecurity. And what we were, kind of our hypothesis or what we were looking to accomplish is we looked at really the Tampa Bay region as a whole. We know we have workforce challenges, employers are having difficulty finding entry level talent, but we knew there was so much talent here, raw talent, and there was also many existing security practitioners that nobody knew about. And nobody knew about them because, you know, as a security practitioner, now more than ever post COVID, you have the ability to work remote in most cases. So we had a very high concentration of very experienced, very well-known, um, very good security practitioners here in Tampa that never had really the opportunity or platform to engage with what we call at the Undercroft aspiring security practitioners. So folks that are looking to transition to the security field that really don't know where to get started. Um, and, and one thing really stuck with me from my time at SecureSet, one of the co-founders, Alex Kryline, had written a, uh, an article called Marketing is Killing Cybersecurity. And I looked at this from a, a workforce standpoint and kind of looked at some of the challenges we had with producing quality candidates 
in some of my earlier programs that I had put together or even in traditional academic programs. And what we had continued to see was kind of this proliferation of a marketing message coming out you know, on the workforce side that, hey, do you wanna make six figures? Join our program and go into cybersecurity. I took issue with that as a marketing message because in my experience, out of every 10 folks that I saw that wanted to make a transition to this field, only about three to four of them were really there because they had, they were curious, they were passionate about computers and technology, they were passionate about service, and those were always those those students that I saw leaving to go on and do great things, whether that be, you know, accelerate in their career field uh, very rapidly, start their own businesses, um, things like that. So we really looked at, you know, how do we kind of focus at the lower levels of the community instead of the higher levels, you know, whether that be enterprise security companies you know, big groups like ISSA, what have you. How do we get to the root of the cybersecurity ecosystem in local areas and provide a physical place for both aspiring and existing security practitioners to come together, um, build networks, share knowledge, and basically participate in a concept known as situated learning. Um, and that's really what our goal was in starting the Undercroft, was providing, you know, if you look at our vision, it's a home and a voice um, for security practitioners. And for me personally, as a veteran, that, that really what drives me every day and drove me to kind of jump in at first and get this organization rolling was it really filled that hole that had been missing in me since I left the military service, which was having a group of brothers and sisters surrounding me and others that really wanted to help not only me, but others within this community grow and be the best possible version of themselves not only professionally. So one thing, you know, you can go to an academic program and you can learn how to, you know, pass a, uh, a Security Plus certification, for example, you can learn about the CIA triad, but until you have a place and mentors that are gonna help you apply those skill sets, it's gonna be very difficult for you to kind of plan the rest of your career from that, that hire to retire standpoint. So really, you know, how the Undercroft got started, um, myself and my co-founder, Chris Makowski, who is our, um, our creative director or our chief creative officer, if you've seen us online, all of the great artwork, videos, uh, production quality, everything we put out is all of Chris's brainchild. Um, and I met Chris, he was actually a student in one of the first cohorts uh, at SecureSet when we stood up their program. And uh, myself and Chris, you know, he kind of completed that other side of the equation, like, I know what I want to build, but how do I tell that story? And, and Chris really is an expert at telling that story. So we got started in uh, 2018. You know, really the way we kind of got the ball rolling on this is I mentioned Softworks before. Um, when we stood up SecureSet, um, their facility was right across the street from us in, in uh, Ybor City, Florida. And right about the time I decided to leave, uh, you know, take my leave from SecureSet to go look for my next challenge, uh, SOCOM had outgrown that space and moved down to Second Avenue um, to a much larger facility, but still in the historic district. And I said, wow, if there's any time to get this concept rolling, to get this guild and development center up and running, now's the perfect time because I've got a newly vacant facility right across the street from where you know, we had built up secure set. Oh, and by the way, SOCOM had dropped a crap load of money in, in facility improvements, having a dedicated fiber line, you know, it would really limit a lot of the resources we would have to put into play to get the facility to where it needed to be. Also, you know, when, when Chris and I were getting this going, we kind of made the, uh, the pact that we did not, that we wanted to bootstrap this. Um, the Undercroft does have a for-profit and not-for-profit component. As such, we are a hybrid not-for-profit. Um, the reason we structured it that way is we wanted to, to create something that has sustainability and staying power. Where, you know, with a traditional not-for-profit, for example, you may be relying on one large donor or one large um, grant. If that goes away, you have no sustainability. Whereas on the for-profit side, which is our, our development center where we have office space available, we have co-working space for members of the guild, um, we offer training, that was a way for us to provide some sustainability because the, the for-profit side of the house can always support um, the, the, the not-for-profit side of the house in times of distress or when funding might be scarce. So we started in 2018, the first six months, you know, we started with a $22,000 investment of my own money and a small um, SBA Veterans Express loan uh, for $125,000. We said, we're going to get in here. We're going to work our butts off. We're going to put in a bunch of sweat equity. Uh, myself and Chris spent the first six months of 2018, you know, painting and patching walls, purchasing furniture, building furniture in many cases because we didn't have a huge budget, um, really leading up to which what, what was our... Um, our, our soft launch or our, our soft opening, which was in July of last year, when we ran a Kickstarter campaign that really anchored the foundation of our guild. 
um, our founding members as we called them. So going into July, we had anchored our, uh, our facility with a couple of what we call residents, which are either cybersecurity startups or cybersecurity companies from outside of the state of Florida that are looking for um, flexible office space to actually establish a presence in Tampa um, and uh, uh, rapidly scale and grow and ideally hire folks from uh, the guild, which is co-located right there with the development center. So we got Kickstarter going, we hit our goals, um, we started growing our membership base, started really uh, filling out all of our resident space um, as we went through 2018. And then as we went into 20, or excuse me, 2019 at this point, going into 2020, we were looking, we were looking really good. The guild was growing, we were ready to start uh, tackling some larger partnerships um, in the community uh, to continue to grow the support and the resources available for the guild to continue to learn and develop and produce new cybersecurity practitioners. Then all of a sudden, as we all know, COVID hit. And uh, when COVID hit, myself and Chris, we looked at each other and said, I don't think we're gonna survive this. Um, obviously with most of our, 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 our business built around the fact that we have a physical building for the security community to congregate, um, for our residents to be able to have workspace, with everybody going remote, we were like, this just isn't gonna work. Um, so we were getting ready to kind of, you know, shutter up and, and shut the things down, but we took a little bit of a dip, actually a pretty substantial dip when we had quite a few residents that uh, transitioned to full remote. Um, we did lose um, quite a few members early on because we had built our concept around, you know, person to person events. So actually being together physically as a community um, and that just disappeared overnight. And uh, this is one area where I'll give, give Chris a lot of credit. You know, we looked at, well, how can we continue to keep this community active when we can't get together physically? And uh, we were able to really, within probably the period of one to two weeks, totally pivot our ability to deliver our weekly content that we did for the Guild to um, streaming and online. Um, and we really focused very heavily on that during the, uh, uh, the March and April timeframes when we were kind of weathering the storm here. And, and things just sort of happened and, and the hope came back when we saw, you know, our members were still participating. Um, we would get messages from, from some of our members saying, hey, you know, this COVID's got me really down. Um, you know, I'm a single father. I got two kids at home. I'm trying to juggle a full time job and, you know, taking care of homeschooling. I'm so happy that this community community is still active, even though we can't be there in person. This has really kept me from circling the drain during this time. And and. That really was you know, great motivation for me, the rest of the team and the rest of the membership base to say, hey, we're gonna push through this and we're gonna make this organization survive this pandemic to, to which we did. So, you know, I'm kind of running up on time here, but uh, you know, that's kind of my story um, and how we got to, you know, I mentioned the roadblocks all the way from childhood to you know, my early educational career in middle school and high school to my dreams being dashed when I wasn't able to pursue or really, you know, take take and, and pursue my dream of being a West Point graduate. Um, and I just kind of bounced around for a while and, and, and finally in the security field found that meaning and that purpose that I had been looking for. Um, since we've started the Undercroft, you know, if you ask any of our members, we, I always say we have our roots in the military. Um, I'd say about 70 to 75 percent of our membership base are military veterans. and. Uh, We'll continue to tout that because we do operate in a way a lot like a, a military organization and that really really helps us continue to swell the ranks of the guild and provide opportunities for people to develop not only personally but prof professionally not only in their chosen career field being cybersecurity, but also you know from anything from a mental health standpoint to a physical health standpoint being able to provide that community where we all have somebody to lean on as we each navigate our own path in this uh, in this massive, expansive, and rapidly growing career field. So with that said, I wanna thank Hacker One very much for letting me kind of tell my story today. Um, I know I didn't have any slides, I did that on purpose. Um, I mentioned this, uh, it's difficult for me to talk to myself, but um, I I'm really thankful for being invited to talk about um, myself and the Undercroft today. And as I mentioned before, anybody that's participating in this event, you know, whether you're, you're in the Tampa area, whether you're not, whether you're on the fence about a career in cybersecurity, whether you're already in the career field and looking to start your own company or anything like that, my door is always open. Uh, feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, check out our website, www.theundercroft.net. We do have opportunities for folks that aren't local to Tampa to engage with the Guild um, as we continue to grow. So I would really encourage you to take a look at us. Um, if you ever have any questions, even outside of that, just for me personally, Feel free to hit me up on email or LinkedIn. I'll be sure that the uh, the Hacker One team has that to share. With that said, everyone, thank you very much for uh, for joining me and listening to my uh, my talk here. Um, I look forward to uh, 
continuing to push what we're doing down here in Florida um, to the next level. And I wish everybody the best um, as we go into uh, the holiday season. Um, and, and obviously with Veterans Day, I thank everybody um, for their service. Um, with that said, thank you all very much. All right. Uh, so with that, thank you uh, to the recorded version of Adam. Um, it was very good. Uh, so I just kind of wanted to close it out. It's been kind of a long day, uh, but I think very good in terms of all the different discussions we've had, starting with uh, Wilson on the path to transitioning sort of out of the military with, with lessons learned about how you can apply the same methodology to finding your next uh, career move uh, within the cybersecurity as well. To um, Tom with VetSec, uh, that was a great short little 10 minute discussion uh, around uh, the VetSec community. Um, and then the obstacle course uh, that Matt hosted, I thought that was really, really fascinating. Such a quick leap into the uh, that obstacle course or the O course uh, for um, the OWASP um, discussion. Um, and yeah, the, the personal sort of discussion with Adam and the intro to the uh, Undercroft, which is again, also really awesome. Uh, such a, amazing groups of communities that are really trying to help vets out in their journey. Um, and kind of, as I mentioned in the beginning, the, the journey for me has been interesting as well. So getting out of the Marines, specializing and working on various different um, physical systems to so then going into cyber and eventually now working on basically a SWAT team of nerds at the Defense Digital Service for the Secretary of Defense. Uh, I get to see it all from both, um, you know, anything from weapon systems to web applications that have issues. Um, and on that note, uh, we actually have a vulnerability disclosure program within the DOD uh, that is pretty, uh, has been very successful, especially during COVID. I, I was keying off of uh, Adam's discussion at the very end there, talking about kind of the hit that the Undercroft took at the end or recently with, um, with COVID, having a physical space is very difficult. And so, um, especially when you can't go to it, right? Uh, so I think what we've seen with the vulnerability disclosure program, it's been a place for researchers and hackers to kind of look at um, vulnerabilities on DoD websites and just kind of refine their skills. So I'd invite you to take a look at our, our VDP as well. Um, and I can put that uh, link here in chat uh, if you're interested. And um, if you want to follow uh, those uh, rules of engagement and, and the scope there, it's a very large scope, uh, basically anything in the dot mill space. And to date, we've gotten over 20,000 reports on vulnerabilities. So that's been fascinating. And we've gotten more during the times of COVID because I guess people just have more time on their hands. Um, so you can test out your skills on our systems. Um, and so with that, uh, I'd also invite you to maybe take a look at uh, DDS as well. So the Defense Digital Service, uh, we have openings for folks as well who specialize in all sorts of things from data scientists to uh, UX folks to to folks in cybersecurity and uh, engineers, et cetera. So if you're interested in that, and joining an, uh, you know, a team of nerds that work essentially for the SecDef, um, head on over to dds.mail. Uh, with that, I'll hit it, uh, let Jen, I guess, uh, close yeah. us out with uh, some notes. And thank you very much for letting me uh, MC this. I'm probably the worst MC you'll ever have, but I appreciate the opportunity. Not at all. <laughs> No, you were perfect. Um, yes, everyone, thank you again. Um, I just wanted to do another announcement um, for our CTF happening this uh, Friday, um, the 13th, closing on the 15th. Um, the website is here. This is just for these folks, um, everyone who registered for the event, and you'll need this code. Um, you'll also need a We Are Hacker One um, uh, username or your uh, uh, email alias in order to, um, to log in. Um, we'll have swag prizes and a cash prize for the top um, winners. So we'll, you'll be um, hearing from us next week um, once those have been, once it's been closed out. Um, but just wanted to say another huge thank you to all of our partners. Um, as Roro uh, mentioned, every single talk was, it was so great to hear about everyone's past journey, um, how they got to where they are and the amazing things that they're doing now to continue cultivating this community. Um, we are so happy to be, um, to have been able to work with each one of you 
Um, and everyone who attended also, um, thank you. I know it's a um, few hours out of your day. Um, I know some folks have to had to jump and um, go back to work and such. So um, you'll be uh, expecting an email from me, um, a thank you email in addition to um, post event survey, um, the CTF information, and I'll include the LinkedIn profiles, um, the uh, VDP <clears throat> link, and all the other information that um, we discussed here. Um, the Discord will still be open. So if you guys wanna continue conversation, um, keep working on the um, on the uh, uh, the course that Matt had um, shared, um, and also the CTF this weekend. Um, if you want to collaborate and discuss with some folks, um, the Discord is where uh, where you'll find that. So, thank you, everyone. Um, I will uh, close it out now. If you have any questions, um, we'll stick around for a couple minutes. But appreciate everyone's time and have a have a good day. Happy Veterans Day and happy birthday to the Marine Corps. Hey, uh, can I put something out real quick? My name's JP, I work for HackerOne. I want you guys to know that Jen is a superstar, amazing, amazing representative helping us out with this veterans program. Um, there are a few of us in HackerOne that are veterans and Jen came to us and said she wants to do this and she killed it, you guys, huge. Shout out to Jen. She's done an amazing job. Thank you to all the speakers. Thanks for everyone for joining. Appreciate it, Jen. Thank you. Yes, and thank you. Thank you to the supporting team as well. Um, all those veterans and folks who volunteered um, within Hacker One who um, helped to push and drive this um, event. So again, thank you everyone. Have a good, have a good day.